begin with just a little quiet sitting. So you can keep the focus of your attention on your breath as it moves in and out or on some external object in the room. And the purpose is just to develop the sense of not being distracted by every passing thought, feeling, sensation. Just to calmly choose a focus for your attention and rest with it. And whenever you find your mind being distracted, going after thoughts of the past or the future or something that's arising, just acknowledge that and then return to the object you've decided on, your breath or something external. We're going to focus on four basic uh, ideas which are familiar in all the schools of Buddhism, really. They're known as the four immeasurables or the four Brahma Viharas love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. And there's a prayer that includes them which will distribute and have a look at and recite together. To sort of set the scene for this, um, I think it's important to reflect on how we function in the world. Generally speaking, we could say there are three different ways of uh, manifesting or behaving. The first is based on assumptions. The second is based on intention. And the third is something which is freely responsive or spontaneous. Often in the past when I've been here, I've been focusing on the third, which is the view of Sokshen. But this uh, middle point of intentionality is also very important as an antidote to the habits of assumption. All of us are caught up in different kinds of assumption. There are general cultural assumptions, assumptions about age, gender, race, class, and so on. We hear someone's accent, and immediately we start to locate them and have projections or fantasies about how they're likely to behave, what their place in the world is. That is to say, we use our assumptions to help us organize the world. But of course, we're simultaneously organizing ourselves. We're setting up particular patterns. Traditionally, this is called uh, conditioning. Uh, and that conditioning comes about by gathering things together. So we have elements of things that we learn in childhood and school and so on. If we bring these together into patterns, then we live inside these patterns take these patterns to be really true and then look to the world for confirmation of the validity of the pattern. So when you were a child, people might have said, you talk too much or you're very shy or you're always showing off or you should come forward. So we've received all sorts of messages in which people have looked at us, felt they were honestly seeing us but, of course, we're actually looking at us in terms of their frame of reference. All babies are imprisoned in the love of their parents because the parents have expectations and hopes and wishes. And on one level, that's a, a wonderful gift. It's a great thing if a baby can be loved and included. But what are they being included into? into a matrix of assumptions and beliefs. And even if the family is very healthy, even if the values that are being given to the child are good, they're being massaged into the small person as absolute truths. This is how we behave. This is what a good person is. This is how the world is. 
and that creates a kind of dependence or attachment or reliance which if all goes well life can be good but there's a kind of veil a kind of call that never quite gets taken off a sort of muffling to the infinite potential of the world around us that there are many many other ways to live and when we really start to see there are other ways to live it relativizes or puts into question or deconstructs the intensity of reliance that we have on our assumptions about ourselves so a really important part of all our work is to become aware again and again of the kind of numbers we're running the kind of assumptions that we have now you can't operate without assumptions because they give a particular kind of organization to our energy about how we greet people the sort of things we say or don't say the main thing is to just observe oh this is how I am how I am and what I am are not the same thing but if we're so identified with how we are which is constructed out of this cultural system we grew up in it makes it a sort of ridiculous question to think well who am I because I'm just me being me this is what you see is what you get it's what I do so I am what I do but what I do is what I have learned to do out of the rule books and templates of others so it's not so much that we have to change our behavior we don't have to go to uh, speech classes and learn to speak with different voices or drama classes to become more free you can do that if you like the key thing is just to observe oh these are patterns these are conditions arising in myself which I identify with <coughs> And when I hear other people expressing their patterns, I think that one's good, oh, that one's bad. And that's usually on the basis of how it fits or doesn't fit with the, with the structures that I have. So in that way, we start to see ourselves as rhythms or patterns, sort of vibra vibratory kind of capacities which can attune or not attune with other things in the world that is to say what we normally take to be ourselves is a quality of energy arising in the world and actually it's the world's energy it's not really ours we speak a language we meet here together because we can understand English we didn't invent English when we speak we speak using words that belong to the world they're not our world we're our words as they come out of our mouth they appear to be this is what I'm saying these are my words do you hear me do you know mm, I'm speaking mm. but what are we saying is something that we nicked we borrowed <laughs> it's never ours because if it was just ours nobody would understand so the basis of me revealing myself to someone else is the fact that we're both using something quite public the most personal intimate thing you can say is mediated through a public language in the same way we have hopes and fears <coughs> other people have hopes and fears we have jealousies, we have anger, we have desires. Other people seem to have them too. Maybe we're all doing the same sort of thing. So when we make it very personal, we are taking these forms of the world and somehow feeling that we have a unique access to them or that they somehow mark out an individuality I, me, myself, but an individuality made out of things that are in the world. And that 
That's strange, isn't it? So if it belongs in the world, maybe we can start to be more honest about the kind of knots we get tied in. At the moment, there's some uh, degree of hope that the government might choose to be more transparent. Um, it feels as if that could be a good thing. But there's also a question for us about whether we can be transparent. And, and of course, when we feel that how we are is not very good or doesn't please significant people in our lives, we can feel a great deal of guilt about this. And when we feel guilt, we want to cover it up. And even more intense than that is shame. Most people don't get through their childhood without being shamed in some way. <coughs> and what shame does is it separates us from other people, from the environment around us. We go into a kind of bubble of self-reference, often collapsing down into dark, unformed spaces where we float around. And at the same time, it fixes us and seems to define us because we've been turned into an object, somebody to be talked about, to be thought about. And when we take that on, we start to feel, I am a thing. And so I have to spend my life trying to be a good thing, the sort of thing that you might like. Because if you approve of me, I won't be annihilated. So that's already split us into our performative self, me just bopping along, being myself, and this storyline that's running on top. Is it okay? Is it not okay? No. That quality of attention we can call conscience. And clearly, conscience can be quite a good thing. It's like a light that comes on that can stop us just getting lost. We need to learn, and we need to teach children, hang on a minute, stop, look before you leap, do it at the traffic lights, you do it in all sorts of areas to say, you have to think about what's going on. And when you think about something, you relate this unique particular situation to other situations you're connected with. And so you recontextualize the intense moment when the blinkers are coming down and you just want to do what you want to do. However, conscience then, although it has a, a useful function in terms of social adaption and keeping our own personal rhythm somehow, to some degree, in harmony with the social rhythms around us so that we might be reasonably socially adapted, it creates this split inside ourselves because basically it's saying, I can't trust myself. If I can't trust myself, I can't relax. I've got to be on guard. I don't know what's going to slip out. So we've got the sense that there are these habits or tendencies inside us that, almost like Pandora's box, we want to try and keep the lid on. And clearly, some people, if they drink a lot of alcohol, they become rather different. They become rather wild. We think, whoa, put that back in a box, please. <laughs> and a lot of that is because they you know, what's exposed is what hasn't been integrated. So the more we can see, <coughs> excuse me, the kind of assumptions that we have, the kind of unthought about beliefs and see how they operate, <coughs> that looking and observing is different from consciousness in the sense of a conscience, because conscience is judgmental. Conscience is awarding points. It's saying, this is good, this is bad. But if we're just observing, if we see what is going on, that neutral quality of awareness allows things to be revealed. Because, of course, if you judge others, you have a biased opinion. And if you judge yourself, you also have a biased opinion. And the thing about a bias a prejudice is that it always seeks to reinforce itself. It seeks more of the same. So when we practice meditation, one of the things we're attempting to do 
is to relax out of the domain of judgment to provide a more open hospitality to ourselves as we are so that we can really get to know ourselves. So it's very important in the practice to move away from self-hatred, self-criticism, And, of course, linked with that is a particular kind of aspiration. The reason I don't like myself is because I want to be better, or I should be better. So, aspiration can also be part of something which is quite reifying, solidifying, objectifying. That is to say, it's part of the discourse of being a thing, where you exist in the world only in terms of your function, and if you improve your function, you get promotion and go up, and if your function or performance goes down, then you get demoted in some way. And one can live one's life all the time in that sort of internal world, trying harder, trying better. On one level, there's nothing wrong with that. Life is a struggle. It's easy to get lost. Why shouldn't we work hard to stay on track? And the problem is, it develops a, a particular kind of tension and anxiety inside. What is this stuff that gets me lost? Well, it's me, isn't it? It's these sort of devils inside me. I don't know what happens, but sometimes I just do it. In a sense, that is the voice of a supreme narcissism. The voice that says, everything which arises in me is me. I own everything. These are my bad thoughts. Therefore, I can't trust myself because I am a factory that produces some good thoughts but also some bad thoughts. That's why I have to stay on the case all the time. From a point of view of meditation, that's the problem of not understanding the nature of thought. Thought blows through the mind the way autumn leaves blow through the sky. Thoughts come and go. Sometimes they seem very valuable. Sometimes they don't seem valuable. Sometimes they seem useful. Sometimes they don't seem useful. But the more we identify with all of them and say, what arises in my mind is me, this identification keeps us turning because thoughts are very turbulent once you connect with them. So the function of the meditation, this kind that we just began with, is to start to be able to dislocate ourselves from the thought. That's to say, to relocate ourselves in something very simple, observing the breath going in and out, some external focus, and from that vantage point, to be able to attend to what thoughts are. <coughs> thoughts have causes. The Buddha taught all things arise from causes. He also thought, taught that all things that arise from causes will vanish. So thoughts come into the mind, morning, and then they go out of the mind. They're there for a while. The more we can sit and see them just as things which arise and pass, the more the hooks that seem to be on them that bind us into them start to fall back in and thoughts become more smooth. It's just something. It's just something. And we start to see that this capacity for calm, open observation is not really needing anything. That is to say, when you are observing yourself, you start to see that one of the things you observe is your ego formation. The ego always seeks gratification. As long as we identify with this sense of being a fixed individual self, we are bound to a path of trying to get more good things that we like and push away bad things we don't like. Why wouldn't we? Because the ego is a vulnerable identity. It's saying, I exist separate from the world. I have to protect my domain. But when we start to observe ourselves, we see that 
the thought which appears to be me and the thought which appears to be coming at me are both coming and going. It's just air traffic. Into the British airspace flies BA, our national airline, and then comes Lufthansa. How can these Germans be flying in our airspace? Because it's airspace. So, British planes and foreign planes land in the airport. Thoughts which seem to be my thoughts and thoughts seem, which seem to be coming at me both pass through our mind space. That's what they do. When we see them passing, we can make a decision. Which one will we get on? Why am I binding myself into that thought? Most of us have fairly uh, habitual negative thoughts, self-doubting thoughts, agitating thoughts of various kinds. They're not very nice, but we keep them. Why do we do that? Why would you keep a dog that bit you every day? <laughs> These thoughts somehow seem incredibly important or attractive. If you start to look at them, their function is to keep you small. Their function is to keep you limited. Why would you want to be limited? Well, from a Dharma po Buddhist point of view, one of the central questions that we have but don't often really openly ask is, who am I? Ask that in a big way, you get, whoa, very, very uh, uncertain. Oh, I'm this. A quick answer is very nice. I'm male. I'm British. I'm a bad boy. Whatever it's going to be, the, the habitual answer, because it's familiar, it reassures us and becomes like a sort of building block on which we can make our identity. When we start to meditate, we start to see that all these building blocks are floating in space. It's not just building a house on sand. It's just there, there is no ground to these. The ground is actually relational. That is to say, when I believe something about myself, the quality of identification with that thought creates the felt sense, this is who I am. This is who I am. And there seems to be a certainty in that. Oh, so I can relax a bit. Oh, now I know something definite about myself. But we've, we've constructed that out of the air. This is Prospero's island. This is a, a land of magic, of illusion, in which we're all suckers. We just get pulled into these things and believe them. But what is the truth status of what we believe? This is the important thing to examine again and again. Because from the point of view of Dharma, everything that arises is impermanent. It cannot provide a true substantial basis for ourselves. However, what it does provide is a range of very useful tools for engaging in the world. So thoughts are relational. When we share our thoughts with other people, it helps us to connect. That's what they are. They don't define who we are, but they open up the possibilities of being in contact with others. So, this is a central point. And Buddha said, the basis of this uh, world that we have is attachment. An attachment grounded in ignorance. The ignorance is misusing thoughts trying to build a house out of thought. The thoughts are things in the world. Our thoughts are in the world. Our bodies are in the world. They, they cannot, in that sense, be our. Our is a conventional or a nominal title which we apply to something which is there. This is rather strange. It says, our being is being in the world with others. 
that's what's happening all the time. How we are comes into being in different ways with the different people we meet. The more relaxed we are, we show different faces to different people. You speak to a child in the different way you speak to a policeman. When you go to the post office, you speak in a different voice than speaking to a friend. That's just how we are. Our energy manifests in different ways to bring about connections with others. That energy doesn't tell us who we are. It tells us what we are in the terms of like, what this is. This is a flower. A flower is something manifesting in the world. A flower is created out of, in terms of the immediacy of our experience, out of shape and color. We can learn the name of the flower and put the name on the flower and then we know what it is. Oh, it's its name. But it's not its name. Because it's only its name in England. If you go to another country, they call it something different. Language and the world are not the same thing. Language hovers over the world like a, a grey cloudy sky over Macclesfield. It's not the same thing. And assumption one of the most difficult assumptions that we have to face is our intoxication with language. Now here, I'm blethering on to you, I'm talking away, lots of words coming out my mouth. It's important that we, we think about well, what is speaking and what is listening. It's the movement of conventional categories which creates an energetic resonance. We feel something's going on. If at lunchtime you were to be given a written examination about what had happened this morning, I wonder what the success rate would be. <laughs> because actually, we're not here cramming for an exam. We're somehow but being connected in a way that hopefully relaxes and opens us up to get us more sense of what being present is all about. And in that sense, language is a kind of massage. Sometimes language is a very bad massage and it increases the knots in the muscles because we freeze up, we feel attacked, we feel undermined. And sometimes it's a very soft and gentle massage or a Swedish massage or even rolfing that's going right in. There are many ways of speaking. And if we focus on the energetic impact of speaking rather than just kind of skimming the cream off the top, going for the semantic register, what the words seem to mean, we probably get more out of it. Because, of course, what the words mean is always what they mean to me. So we're taking the meaning and flipping it into our frame of reference, and most of it slips off the plate because it doesn't fit. So we go shopping with our assumptions. Not this, not that. Ah, I like that one. Why do I like it? Because that's what I like. I know what I like, and I like what I know. That's a pretty sealed world. So hopefully we can start to see that uh, this word assumption carries a lot of implications. It's about taking for granted. And Buddha's teaching is nothing is for granted. Everything arises from causes and conditions, exists for a while, and then starts to dissolve. Sometimes the ending is very sudden, sometimes it's very gradual. But certainly there is nothing which was created which is going to last forever. If it comes into time, it's going to go out of time. So when we start to look at our assumptions, the key thing is what, what beliefs in eternalism do I carry? On one level, most of us probably operate on the basis of thinking we'll live forever. That's a sort of ground basic view. Of course, we have more rational thoughts that say, uh-uh, I'm going to die. Death is coming. We see our bodies aging and so on. But we don't necessarily act on the basis of that. If we really thought, I'm going to die, what sort of a spring cleaning would that bring to our lives? What would we really want to change? There may be many things that we haven't said that we need to say. There may be 
many things in our lifestyle, our behavior, our connection with others that we would change if we thought we only have three months or six months to live. But by somehow imagining we have this infinite time ahead of us, we often continue inside our assumptions because it's quite a lot of work to change. Which is why, generally, the work of change involves this second category that I marked up, which is intentionality. That by having a conscious intention, you run a clear trajectory across time. You say, I am going to do this. I'm going to take more exercise, or I'm going to put aside some time for meditation every day, or I'm going to do the garden more regularly, or I'm going to make sure I visit my old friends and don't lose contact with them, or I'm going to start an evening class in the autumn and carry it all the way through. Of course, as soon as you have an intention it's as if it rings a little bell and welcomes in all the obstacles. Of course, if you don't have any intention, you don't have any obstacles because you're just bopping about. As soon as you decide to do something, problems arise. If we're not very present, we will go into the habitual patterns, which are fine because it's what we've always been doing, they're only called problems because we now have a new intention. As soon as you have an intention, it redefines the terrain you've been operating in. As soon as you think, I want to change my diet, then you look in the cupboard and there's kind of ingredients or food that you think, well, I better not eat that now. But then you think, oh, well, it's quite tasty and it's very bad to throw food away. I'll just finish that. And of course, as you finish it, when you go to the shop, you think, well, I'll get some more of that because that's what I'm eating. So the intention easily gets washed away. Maintaining an intention is hard. And that's why with the meditation we began with, at one level, it's a very simple thought. I'll just focus my attention through this clear intention. I won't stray from my breath. But we find ourselves again and again being carried hither and thither. And it's quite a struggle to come back. Because, of course, the things that are carrying us away are not particularly bad in themselves. It's just not what we're doing now. It's very hard to get a sense of doing things in a particular time, in a particular place, and not doing anything else. It's one of the big struggles for teachers in primary schools how to get children who've been running around in the playground to settle in the class and give focused attention. The numeracy and literacy levels are appalling in this country, and the degrees of distraction in children are just mind-boggling. We have these young people who are just ca caught by anything bright and shiny and noisy that goes by. And the, the possibility of them having an, <coughs> excuse me, an internal triage, an internal sorting out so that they can say, this pertains to this, and that pertains to that. And I will cleave to this when it's time for this, and I'll cleave to that when it's time for that. It gets more and more difficult because of the rapidity of response, the sense I should be able to live my life on my terms, which becomes more and more pervasive in the culture. It's not just Margaret Thatcher saying there's no such thing as society, it's that this is now a pervasive feeling. It's all about I, me, myself. And because of that, how can I hold an idea in myself that is stronger than the immediacy of the uprising of my habitual assumptions and impulses? It's very, very hard. In the old days, you know, when Freud was first marking out his model, the second model he had has the superego, the ego, and the id, or the unconscious, the conscious self, and the more controlling, directive uh, rules and regulations. But if you read modern therapy books, you don't see the word superego very much at all, because it's just washed out of the culture. The idea that you shouldn't do things, 
seems like a, an imposition on personal freedom. But of course, as soon as we make an intention, we're setting up a should inside ourselves. Because at first, the intention may feel like a desire. I'm going to do this because I really want to do it. But as soon as that movement towards the goal that we have comes under attack from our habitual assumptions and patterns of behaving, we have to fight back. And that's when the power of should comes back. I should do this. I should get up in the morning to do my meditation. Now, if I'm going to do that, and a friend says, let's go for a drink the night before, then I have to think, well, with this friend, I'm likely to drink a lot, so I'm going to wake up not very well, so I'm li not likely to do the meditation. But I like my friend, and I don't get out very much, so it's quite nice to do that. So what should I do? That, that is the, the whole question with intentionality. It will bring battle <coughs> to your life. It will bring struggle. As long as you're kind of lazy, fair, easy, ozy, go with the flow, it doesn't matter too much. But as soon as you say, in this life, I want to do this, whether it's developing how you play tennis or redoing the back bedroom or doing the garden or learning to cook something new or doing meditation, all of these desires are projecting a sort of ring fence space into the future. You're marking a little table reserved. I am going to do this at this time. But your habits are used to sitting at that table. They come in, throw the reserve notice out the window and sit down. <laughs> Here we are. Right. And then you've lost it. So you've got to say, <coughs> this is reserved. I'm not going to do that. But why? Why should I? I don't feel like it. Then we start to become aware of how we function as people. I don't feel like it. This is so powerful, isn't it? That my feeling, which is both a sort of body sensation and a bit of emotion, it's quite a complex thing, it seems to be saying the truth about myself. So it's almost that if I cleave to my intention, I will be doing a violence to myself because I don't feel like it. I find that when I try to do exercise, because I now have a new regime, I should do some more exercise. So I start to do something, and then after a while I find I'm doing something else. I have no conscious memory of when I stopped, I don't know, trying to touch my toes or something like that. Suddenly I'm doing something else. Clearly, I don't have a very strong desire to practice touching my toes. Exercise for me seems a completely pointless, meaningless thing. But it would be a good idea if I did some. So I'm struggling with years and years and years of assumption that this is nuts. Now, clearly, <laughs> lots of people don't think it's nuts. I know lots of people who are yoga teachers and dance teachers and so on. I know lots of people who are very healthy. But I tend to think, well, that's their existence. <laughs> Good luck. It's very wonderful. But and now I think, oh, oh, so what is it that stops it being invested? Well, I've already backed another horse. I've backed studying, thinking, doing different kinds of practice, doing therapy, and so on. My energy is so used to flowing down certain channels that redirecting it into something else is very difficult. Because it has to be a real conscious struggle. Because if I don't remember to think about it, it won't happen. Because what will happen is simply the upwelling of my habitual pattern. Now, would you imagine that's familiar to most of us? <laughs> and it's something about, well, this is where we see what attachment is. Attachment is not necessarily a conscious relationship with something that we, we feel, oh, I need this. It's more an unconscious or implicit, a covert alignment with patterns so that the pattern feels so natural, it fits so well that we just do it because we do it.
that's what we do, that's who we are. So trying to slice across that is really hard. It involves a real struggle. Me as I'm used to being, and me as I want to be. This requires the development of the traditional virtues. Courage, patience, endurance. Because if we're going to change something, it's not a sprint, it's not a flash in the pan. It has to be maintained through time, and that requires diligence. So these um, qualities that we'll be looking at soon, they all require a, both a reframing of how we make sense of the world, but also a re-mobilizing, a re-organizing of how we come into the world. And that can't be just on the basis of a positive aspiration, this is what I'm going to do, because we're always going to find resistance. And the resistance is the um, habituation of patterns which have become part and parcel of ourselves. So Tennyson in, in his poem Ulysses says, I am a part of all that I have met. And that's how it is, isn't it? We grow up in a family and so many of the factors of how our parents were become part of us. Either directly, because we internalize them and reproduce them, or through their photographic negative style, where we say, uh-uh, I'm never going to do that, and we dedicate ourselves to doing the opposite. But both of these are positions in dialogue with what we encountered. So on the most general level, for doing the, the, the practice, we have to develop the capacity to observe ourselves with kindness. Not to blame or to judge, but just to see in a very neutral sense, what is it that I do? How do I become how I am? What is the howness of my existence? How do I walk? How do I talk? How do I sit? How do I eat? How do I relate to other people? How do I entertain thoughts, feelings and sensations? That is to say, we're in relation all the time with external factors, with internal factors. How do we do that? Because, of course, when we look around, we see other people do it in different ways. So the first thing is to become curious about ourselves. Because curiosity is very different from judgment. Curiosity is neutral, is curious in all directions, and it's not starting with any preformed conclusion. That is to say, we're not looking for anything in particular. We're just looking, not going into a shop. Can I help you? No, I'm just looking. <laughs> just looking. I've, done, I've crossed the threshold into your shop, but I've no commitment to buy anything. We cross the threshold into ourselves. We don't need to buy any of it. We just can think, whoa, there's a lot of old stock here. How <laughs> to <laughs> clear the rails, you know, what is all this stuff? And really to see, huh? And, and it's so important then to enter into a relationship with guilt and shame. Because guilt and shame link with anxiety and fear. How much of our lives have been limited by fear of what other people think of us or what they might think of us, fear of what we feel about ourselves or what we fear we might become. Now, the really the best antidote to that is to look and see what are the ingredients. Because if you know what the ingredients are, you can pretty well work out what kind of cake you're going to make. And it probably won't be as bad as you imagine. And the more transparent you can be with yourself, it's much less difficult when other people call you out on something. Because you know. If somebody says you're selfish, no, I'm selfish. That's what I'm selfish. Okay. Now what? What should we do with it? It's something one can work on. But if you're working on it in secret because it's a guilty, bad thing and 
I can only make it public when I've already solved the problem. In many ways, that's to betray other people. And that's because, going back to what I opened up with, we are social creatures. Everything we have is public. The greatest fantasy is to imagine that our badness or our limitation or our difficulties are something that we alone have. They're shared with everyone else. So when we cover up, we make it more difficult for other people. This is the whole tragedy of what's happening with the government. That here's a moment for transparency in lots of ways with the new possibility of an inquiry about Iraq. But the tendency to cover up, to defend, to pretend, it gives a permission to all of us to cheat ourselves, and through cheating ourselves, to cheat other people. You know, our lives are probably rather difficult. Might have difficulties with parents who are getting old, with children, with friends, relationships, work, and so on. We have difficulties with ourselves. Why do we imagine that's unusual? Why would we imagine that's something special? So when other people can offer us some help to see how we are, that's the most fantastic thing. And this Dharma attitude allows us then to develop a kind of equanimity towards ourselves, where we can see sometimes I'm very generous, sometimes I'm very kind. And sometimes, I don't really care. I just don't want to hear anyone. I don't want to see them. Just go away. These are movements of energy. Expanding, welcoming, closing down, defending. That's what they are. If you reify that, if you turn it into a substance, you then say, I'm a selfish person. Then you put a judgment on top saying it's very bad to be a selfish person. Then you put an intention on top of that, I don't want to be a selfish person. That doesn't really help. Much more useful is to start to observe yourself as this pulsation. Just opening, closing. The heart is going ba-dum, ba-dum, systolic, diastolic. The lungs are opening and closing. This is what happens. Our body is rhythmic and our minds are rhythmic too. Sometimes we're available, sometimes we're not available. Sometimes we're kind, sometimes we're angry. Oh, this is how I am. But then we've got this whole cultural narrative. I, but you shouldn't be like that. I shouldn't be the way I am. Okay, we have to fit in the culture. But f from the point of view of Dharma, it's so important just to see what is actually going on. Because if you can see it for what it is, you start to be able to work with it. And if you work with it, it's not so bad. If you get a puppy, or if you have a baby, one of the first things you get to know about them is they poo a lot. And they pee and poo in places where you wouldn't want them to do it. So you get to pick up shit. That's what you have to do. Now you think, uh, uh. Or you think, oh, you just do it. And it's that capacity to think, it's just stuff that allows cleaning up a baby or cleaning up after a puppy. That's what you do. It's just neutral. But as soon as you add this intense emotional reaction to it, you make it much more difficult. And then you build up a kind of resentment and you get angry. And you see people hitting little puppies on the nose. No, 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 you mustn't do that. Little oh, puppy. It's insane. It's just insane. So it's exactly the same with ourselves. It's not that we're trying to let ourselves off the hook or get away with it, but to find a more subtle, a closer way of working with our tendencies by seeing what they are, that they are movements of our life energy, which... If it's allowed to relax and move free, you can get it to move in easier directions. But if it remains knotted tightly because you keep blaming yourself and pulling on the end so that the knot's getting really closed in, much more difficult to work on. Okay, shall we take a break there? And uh, then we'll return into the text.
Are there enough to go around? Should be just about. Yeah, good. So, um, these uh, attributes uh, are called immeasurable because it said that the, the benefit that derives from them is immeasurable. Immeasurable because the focus of attention that they have is immeasurable. It's not a limited uh, intention in the usual way. Um, so I'll just say a little bit about the first one, then we can go into reciting the verse, just to give you the, the example. So, as it says in, in the English, may all sentient beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. So, the object of the intention is all sentient beings. Now, there are a lot of sentient beings. This doesn't mean just human beings. It means all the animals, the insects, beings in different realms. It means there is no limit to this intention. There is nobody outside this intention. Therefore, it includes our friends, our enemies, the people we like, the people we don't like, people we are afraid of, people we are uh, uncomfortable with. It means wishing well to all beings and w wanting them to have uh, happiness is not just for a day or for a moment. This statement, may all beings have happiness and the root of happiness, is said to be the definition of love. That's what love is. It's wanting all beings to be happy. Now, that's very, very far from a romantic vision of love. Romantic love, which is pervasive in Western culture and increasingly pervasive in the world, is an idea that some people are special, and these special people are the people we love, and then there's the rest, and we don't love them. And were we to love the rest, the special person will get pissed off. <laughs> because they say... I'm saving all my love for you. Thank you very much. Now, so what is the difference in these kinds of love? To want all beings to be happy means to want them to be free and fulfilled and to be in their own skin as they are. We're not wanting them to be in any way for us. We don't want them to be happy for our sake. It's not, I want to be happy, but I can only be happy. I can't be happy till I've made you happy too. Because somehow, your sour face is a real party pooper. <laughs> it's not like that. It's a gift or an openness that the freedom, the release, the relaxation, other people finding their own way, being themselves, expressing themselves, is wonderful. And that that is wonderful over and above any implication it might have for me. Because usually we want people to be happy, but not in a way that would make us unhappy. But this is just saying, may all beings be happy. So it's an intention which immediately contradicts the uh, pull back which comes, what about me? What about me? So this is a, a kind of uh, massage again, something that we have to knead into ourselves again and again to soften the tendency of appropriation that this world has re special resources and I want to get as much of them as I can and therefore I'm in conflict with other people. So love means to be for the other. But it's also saying, may all sentient beings, now I'm a sentient being so I'm included in it as well, so it's not just for the other, it's for myself. All means me as well. 
not me first, not necessarily me last, but me as part of the whole thing. I am a participant in all of this, and I want all the participants to be happy. Which means having a, a big thought, but as an ordinary person. There's not an inflation that goes with it. So love here is inclusive, without a demand, a wishing well, wishing good things for the other and for oneself. Now, then, but it's saying not just that we want them to have happiness, but the root of happiness. This is where it becomes less like a sort of ordinary good intention, because most people, you're walking down the street, they say, yeah, it's a good idea, everyone's happy, and of course I'm not against that. It's when we start to think, well, what is the root of happiness? What is the cause of happiness? Is it external things? Is it having a lot of money, or a nice house, or a new car? Well, clearly these things can bring some kind of alleviation from fear, anxiety, uh, sense of loneliness being cut off. The ego can be reassured by uh, having a kind of calling card into the world. I'm a normal person. I'm a successful person. Therefore, don't kind of do me down and also don't investigate me too much. But the the happiness that this is talking about is a, is a happiness that endures. And the happiness that's generated out of new things, whether it's a new relationship or uh, new possessions, isn't going to last forever. It may feel as if it will last forever, but that's just the encapsulated moment. That's the overprivileging of an exciting moment as if it was telling us the truth about moments to come, but it's not how it is. When we look over our shoulder at our past and we see all these intense enthusiasms we've had and how we felt, oh, this is it, it's not really like that. that the, the energy, the libido drains out of the moment and then it's just life as usual and then it gets a bit dreary and so on. So no object can provide happiness. That would be a general Buddhist idea, that we, we look again and again to the objects in the world as if they will provide enduring happiness. So what they can do is provide momentary happiness, but not an enduring happiness. Enduring happiness is a quality of the subject, of ourselves. That is to say, each sentient being, sentient meaning able to feel, that is to say, they are alive, they have mind, they have an awareness, that awareness itself is the root of happiness, not the objects that come to it. And perhaps you can see how this links to what I was saying before the break about meditation and the relation to thoughts. Because thoughts are like inner objects. Some good thoughts arise and we feel happy, happy, and then some bad thoughts or sad thoughts come and then we don't feel so good. In that way we are object-related. We are moved around by the happenstance of whatever is occurring. Which means we have no power, very little clarity, and no continuity of our state, because we are always in reactivity to what's going on. So from the Buddhist point of view, to find the cause of real happiness, we have to investigate, who am I? What is this? that I am. What, what is my existence? What does it mean to be alive? Having eyes and ears, hearing cars going by on the road, seeing the colors in the room. Who is having this experience? This is the, the central point. Who is the one who is happy? Who is the one who is sad? That one has no access to permanent happiness. The aspect of ourselves that is involved in the world, that is conditioned by the world, 
that is lifted up by good things and cast down by bad things like a cork on the waves that's just our ordinary ego self that's in, enmeshed in the world rather than participating in it it's always prone to being locked into hopes that good times will last and always susceptible to fears that bad times will arrive and because of that it's endlessly pushing away what it takes to be bad and pulling in what it takes to be good there is no rest for that positioning in oneself in the Dharma teaching is that this aspect of ourselves is not something to be removed it's not something to be hated or despised it's not an obstacle in itself it's just part of the story it's not the whole story about who we are and the reason it causes trouble is because a part is pretending to be the whole so the function of the meditation practice is to find out more directly immediately the infinity of our own awareness, the infinity of our own presence and within that our little ego is still going to carry on doing this, that and the other but within a background field of spaciousness and then gradually the knots untie and life gets much easier so the cause of happiness is not to be caught up in the fantasies of the will to power control I did it my way all the, the ways in which we think my life is up to me if I don't do it it won't happen I'm in charge because when we actually observe our lives we're not in charge things happen all the time people close to us get sick the weather changes economics condition changes and our lives get blown about now, if we set up the very common polarization, either I'm in charge or it's out of control, we create something terrifying for ourselves. Because then we're in the constant battle against disorder. In its extreme form, that's what we call uh, obsessional compulsive disorder, where people are endlessly trying to impose their will on the situation by washing their hands, cleaning the house, and so on. It's a dreadful, dreadful condition to get into because there is no end to it. Dust happens to be a sharing occupant of this world. We share space with dirt. You will never get rid of dirt. But if you imagine my life can't begin until things are really, really clean, all you do is punish yourself by not understanding the world you live in. It's a similar way when we set up a control structure in our mind. I have to get myself sorted. I can't relax until this is done. What you do is you create a prison for yourself because it will never be done. As my mother used to say, there's I something. There's always some damn thing arriving that you have to do. It's always, always. That's how life is. It's one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. So it will not end. That's what impermanence means. It's not, there is no final solution. There is no arrival point. There is no living happily ever after. Turmoil is existence. Nobody here, I imagine, has a life free of turmoil. Sometimes it looks mainly external turmoil. Sometimes it feels like internal turmoil. But there's always some kind of turbulence. This turbulence comes from connection. We live in the world with others and how they are impacts us and affects us. If we don't want that to happen, we could take a lot of drugs and get spaced out. But then you wouldn't have much of a life. To be alive is to be disturbed. If you choose to have kids, they will disturb you until you die. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> that's part of their function <laughs> so you know there's always something going on and it's once we start to see oh this is what samsara is in the Tibetan language it's called korwa korwa means turning 
turning is not necessarily like a wheel down the road. It's, it's more turning in all sorts of directions. That is to say, it's not something you can stop. Now, what makes the difference between samsara and nirvana is that in samsara, we try to stop something which is turning. In nirvana, it's described as being peaceful, free of desire. You're not trying to stop it. You allow it to run. And you do that on the basis of thinking, good times will come and go, bad times will come and go. So when good times come, we don't go ha 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 ha. And when bad times come, we don't go boo hoo hoo. We just live in them. Of course we can laugh and cry, but it's not trying to say this is better than that. So the middle way, this term that you see again and again in Buddhist teachings, means this is what there is. This is what there is. That is to say, the middle way is me being in the middle of it. Not going to the extreme of saying, I like this, I need more of it. Or the other extreme, I don't like this, I don't need any of it. But you stay in the middle, in your life. You participate in your existence as it occurs, however it occurs. And sometimes it's going to be good and sometimes it's going to be bad. Now that requires letting go of maps. The maps that we develop in our childhood about how the world should be, how we should be and moving away from reliance on mental conceptualization, various kinds of elaborations, hopes and fears, come to live more in the moment, in the present, without maps, just inhabiting the territory. A territory which will change moment by moment. How do we do that? Well, if the territory is changing, we have to change to be there. The only way to do that is to stop carrying so much burden of assumption, karmic tracing, patterns, and so on. That means, as we were looking before the break, examining what am I made of? How do I operate? And that so many of the things that we rely on and we believe on, believe in, have come from the past. They don't necessarily have anything to do with our current circumstance. How will I respond? Oh, I know. I'll look at what I did ten years ago. But this is a different situation, and we are different. How will I respond? You have to live in your belly. Your belly will tell you very directly what's there. You have to feel the world. You can't think it out. Because it takes time to think. But the belly's very quick. You just get a sense of it. But of course, as we looked earlier, we've learned not to trust our intuition. We've learned, be careful, develop a consciousness, look before you leap. And while there's some truth in that, it's, it takes you up from your belly up into your head, thinking about things. Oh, give me a moment, I need to think about it. I'm, life only gets safe if I'm not quite in it. I'll get back to you. But who's going to get back? I'll be changed and the other person will be changed and the moment will be gone. You've got to be there. So how can I be there when I'm so confused? If I'm there, won't I just be enacting my habitual tendencies under the power of all these impulses? Oh. That's where meditation comes in because through the practice we start to separate our awareness from the objects of the awareness. So we can feel something arising and if, if it is in harmony with the situation, we just move through it. And if it's not, we don't. The decision is made very, very quickly. It'd be like driving a car fast on a motorway. There isn't time to think. You have to be there. And if you're off in your head, that's often where accidents occur. You've got to get back from thinking to just being there. People who are good at driving just have everything is flowing through them. They're just part of this moving stream. And it's the same in, in life all the time. By being part of things, by not separating ourselves and being apart from them, 
you get the optimal information about the situation and because you're already part of the situation you move with it because it is our world everyone we meet is our person everyone we meet is our self in many ways not in terms of a kind of personal self inside me but my world is made out of what I encounter I am made out of what I encounter how I am is changed by what I encounter so to that sense in that sense you are me because how you are will allow me or provoke me to be in particular ways so other people are, are no more other than we are other to ourselves we don't really know who we are we don't really know who they are but in between we have conventional thoughts about who I am we have conventional thoughts about who other people are and these two narratives bang into each other all the time sometimes winning sometimes losing if we relax and open we don't know who we are we also don't know who other people are but that's not the end of the world we find ourselves responding this not knowing is not the same as ignorance in Buddhism what's called ignorance is a kind of knowing ignorance is relying on cognitions on thoughts to make sense of the situation and that in itself because it's very uh, involving and absorbing that in itself involves ignoring what else is there and what is there is the immediacy of contact and I'm sure everybody here has had many experiences in their life where it's just been dead simple maybe you're dancing with someone or you're playing tennis with them you're doing something lively or you're making love or you're having a conversation over dinner or whatever and it's just going to and fro and it just feels like you're part of something these are lovely moments and they're lovely because that's really how our life is and then we go back to thinking about it and trying to make sense of it or trying to remember what happened or recreating it and all of these just cause it to fade away because actually these moments arise when we're there which goes back again to the question well, what is it that causes me not to be there what am I doing when I'm not there what is so interesting or exciting or useful about all the very many ways in which we get lost so for this level of practice it's very important to start examining that in ourselves, sometimes keeping a little diary and just catching ourselves, you know, when you're off doing a number in your head in a daydream, try to write it down, look at it afterwards, catch the structure of it. What is that? What's so interesting in that sort of fantasy that I feel better off there than here? Because if we are here, and we relax and open and welcome the world as it comes we remain intact however shitty the situation is but once we get into judgment and sorting things out and trying to have it on my terms and pushing things away that cutting the world and putting it into good and bad cuts me at the same time that's the problem with it the master is never safe. The master is always torn. That's the problem with mastery. Because if you're dominating the situation and insisting it and directing it, there's always going to be doubts that come. Things are never going to work out quite how you thought they would. And so there's anxiety. And we hear about poor Gordon Brown being you know, angry and agitated and throwing his phone about and shouting at people. Well, I mean, who wouldn't? It's a very terrible job. But of course, he can't say publicly, it's a very terrible job. He has to always say, I'm very competent. I'm the best man for this job. <coughs> what a terrible thing to have to lie about how bad it is by, because by pretending that you're good at it, you somehow give other people confidence. But actually, probably all of us would have more confidence if he said, this is a shit job, this country's down the pan, we've all got a lot of problems. We'd all say, 
Oh, yeah, well, at least you're talking the truth. We recognize that one. And we do the same thing ourselves. It's again and again to recognize how we cheat ourselves by imagining that we are more in control. Because the one who wants to be in control is the ego. That is to say, a self-referential, self-reflexive moment of subjectivity. A subjectivity which encapsulates itself as an island separated from the environment that it moves towards or away from. When we relax and open, we enter an awareness which is not like that. It's an awareness which is inclusive, which sees subject and object arising together, traditionally what's called non-duality, and we're just part of what's going on. We find ourselves speaking, doing, reacting. So, in this part when it's saying, may all beings have the cause of happiness, it's uh, wanting for all beings to relax out of the fantasy of individual identity, to experience themselves as one, what they take to be themselves, as one of the many field factors, a factor or an energy uh, nexus moving in this whole field of experience, and simultaneously, who is the one who is aware of this whole field of experience? We. So in that sense, we have a dual nature which is not really dual. We are both a panoramic awareness. As we sit in this room, we're aware of ourselves and other people. It's all arising together at the same time. And we also have a unique sense of being the inhabitants of this body. Both are simultaneously true. We are an infinite awareness and we are a precise embodiment. These are not two orders of being, but they're part of the natural integration. But as long as we feel we are only this skin bag, we are only this separated monad, peering out at an alienated world, of course fears and anxieties and hopes would arise. Why wouldn't it? If you're cut adrift, if you feel you don't belong in your own land, how, how dreadful that would be. So that's really what ignorance is. It's a forgetfulness of the natural integration of life, which is not the same as homogenization. We don't all go in the blender and end up with some kind of Buddha zombie. You know, as energy manifests in the world with all its particularities according to how it is. Some people will like chocolate cake. Some people will like carrot cake. Does it matter? What matters to them? Does it matter? It doesn't matter at all. Some people like to sleep a lot, some people sleep very little. Does it matter? No. Does it matter to them? Yes. So we're always operating on these different levels. But when you let this I, me, myself story become the dominant story, that is to say, I am a small person, and, and on top of that you want to say, and I'm king of the world, and I can live my life on my terms and do what I want, I mean, that's to create big headaches for yourself. Because you can't be small and omnipotent at the same time. But usually, it's our very smallness that makes us want to be omnipotent. Teenagers are very honest in demonstrating this all the time. They're very anxious and worried. They hide in their bedroom. And then they come out really bossy and controlling and kind of insist on doing whatever they want. And then they get upset. And the reason they're so bossy and controlling is that they feel they should be in charge. Because it's so shaming not to know who you are or what you're doing. But in some ways they're just more honest than we are. We do the same thing. We pretend to have a mastery which we don't have. Because we imagine that the opposite of mastery is some kind of subjugation, some kind of enslavement into being under the power of others. But when we relax a bit and we look around, we can see very clearly everyone we meet is nuts. Everyone is out to lunch. <laughs> Everyone's just buzzing in their own little tune. It's really easy. If you don't play golf, go to a golf club. Watch people playing golf. You say, what is this? If you don't know anything about football, go to a football match. What is this? 
People are into it. People understand. They understand the history of football teams. They know who scored more goals than someone else. Why? <laughs> Why would anybody want to know that? Well, clearly, some people do. That's their kind of madness. I'm mad in my Buddhism. It's just another form of madness. The actual teaching you can give in five minutes. It's just about being yourself. That's all. All the rest is like knowing about football teams or knowing the mix of cars. It's just information. It's cultural stories. But we all need to have cultural stories because we live in culture. I, mean, I hope you get the sense of this, that it, you can't become nobody at all. But you're not just this one thing. So in Buddhism, they talk a lot about emptiness. Emptiness means what you take to be just this one thing, what you take to be yourself and what you take other people to be. It's just like writing on water. It's just a, a temporary construct. It has no truth in it. It's like reading a novel, <coughs> going to the movies, and being very into a character. And then you think, oh, that character doesn't exist. But we can then pause and think, well, if that character doesn't really exist, how come I believed in them as if they did exist? Oh, maybe that's because what I do all the time. Maybe that's what I'm doing. I'm making characters out of the people I meet. Who they actually are, how will we ever know? Because we have already turned them into some character in the novel of our own existence. We probably experienced other people making sense of us in ways that we didn't quite like. We want to say, I'm not like that. But we are like that for them. We may not be like that for us. Other people will make of us what they will. And we will make of us what we will. But what are we? That's the point where we need to have some meditation, and we'll go into that a bit later. But when we, when we start to see, oh, I'm living in a dream. The Buddha said, everything's an illusion. These are stories. And I think the story is true. So it's not that we have to wipe it away and say, right, no more stories. It's, oh, that's the storyline of my life. Who is the one who experiences the storyline? That open awareness, always fresh, can run many different stories. But will never be caught by a story. You can never tell the truth about yourself. Because we always live in excess. There's always more to us than can come out in a stream of words from our mouths. We reveal ourselves in how we walk and talk. But even someone else observing us couldn't really say what it is. We we get touched and moved by other people. We say, wow. And that's probably as good as it gets. We should probably just leave it at that thing, going around saying, wow, wow. It was amazing. That's amazing what people are, how they are. But then we have our storylines. So being aware of stories is enormously important to see it as story, just as earlier I was suggesting how we manifest this kind of energy. Energy is real, but it's ungraspable. You can't grasp a story. Stories don't have truth in them. Stories feed other stories. They, they exist in chains of signification. They evoke metaphors which open some understanding, close down some understanding. These are pulsations of shared experience, but they're not true. What could we say about ourselves that's true? I could say, I am a man. Well, what does it mean to be a man? I don't know. I'm not like my dad. He was the first man I knew. I'm not like him, so I thought he was a man. Now, if he's a man, I can't be a man because I'm not like him. It's like that, isn't it? I, you know, what does it mean? I'm now 60. My dad died when he was just about 60. He was kind of different in his body from me. He was smoking a lot of cigarettes. That was kind of normal. I'm not smoking any cigarettes. I don't know how long I'll live, but I don't know. See, we don't know. So we think, well, he did that, so where am I in relation to that? Where? 
this in relation to that. This is what stories do. They're relative. They're always moving one thing in relation to another. But who is the one who is saying that or listening to that? Who am I now? So, back to this verse. The cause of happiness is to awaken to a direct sense of who we are. Who is the one who experiences the stories? Who is, who is the one who is alive? What is it to be alive? Is it just the accumulation of life experience? Or is it some shining, ungraspable vitality? Some sort of gleam, like when you look in a little baby's eyes. And there's something just, ah, and they're there. They're not there as very much. They don't really do very much, but they're just very there. And when people are telling you some story about what a shitty day they had at work, they're often not there. You're getting a whack of words, but they, they're not there. Little babies, it's just there. So the part of the meditation is to just be there and then to experience how all the elaborations of the stories, the constructions, they're not wrong, but they're an ornamentation. That's why in, in these paintings you see most of these gods have got ornaments. Some of them have jeweled ornaments, um, they have tiaras, they have diadems, they have uh, uh, armlets, and anklets, and many necklaces, some of them wear bone, or bone ornaments. These ornaments all indicate qualities. They indicate the possibilities of storylines. That all of us show different possibilities of relating and connecting. So that's what it means. Somebody's beating a drum. They're making a sound out into the world. All of us do that. We make sounds. We connect with people. These sounds bring other people towards us or drive other people away from us. That's what we do. So the more we can experience that quality of energy, at the same time knowing that we are not defined by our energy, the more you can let your energy flow 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 free. So the main constraints on happiness are the anxiety that we want something which is impermanent to be permanent. If only all life could be like this. What a perfect day. <coughs> but it won't be. So to wish for the happiness of all beings if that happiness was impossible, would not be very nice. It'd be like saying, well, I'm going to uh, go to prisons and visit prisoners and tell them about walking in the fields. Because I think if they knew a bit more about nature, it would make them happy. Probably it wouldn't. They would just think, well, fuck you. I'm glad you're having a nice time. I'm not. So if the Buddha was doing the same, saying there is a happy land far, far away, that wouldn't be very helpful. Clearly, Dharma is talking about a different kind of happiness from how we ordinarily <coughs> understand it. Just as it's talking about a different kind of love from how we ordinarily understand it. It's not the love of attachment. It's not a kind of mutuality, a kind of contract. I will love you if you love me, and I won't betray you if you don't betray me, and so on, and I'll support you if you support me. The normal sort of balancing that people try to do. It's, this, is, this kind of love is an infinite gesture, and the ground of happiness is an infinite awareness. It's not a limit. It's not a deal. It's not business. Business has become very popular. You know. uh, but business actually is not a very nice word. In Scotland they'd say, oh, sh I wish you'd go and do a business somewhere else. <laughs> it means if you're going to be a dirty whore, don't do it on my doorstep. Because, as Freud pointed out, money is shit. You know, shit, money, shit comes out of our body, it's produced by life. Money is also generated out of life. And if you dedicate yourself to business, 
you're chasing something which is an abstract signifier, which often has led to degradation and suffering for other people. One of the things that Engels pointed out in his uh, analysis of the working conditions of the people in Manchester was that one of the first civic developments in Manchester was building very nice roads that operated between the area of the factories and the places where the rich people had their houses so that the owner of the factory could travel from his lovely house into the factory without looking at the poor housing conditions of the people so that he wouldn't be troubled by the impact of what he was doing. It's not to critique uh, the, the structures of capitalism, but it's to help, try to help us to see that what Marx called mystification is not so different from Buddhism. Mystification means something is going on, but we don't want to know what it is. We see this everywhere, with, like with climate change. People don't want to know what they're doing to the planet. We, every, almost every day in the newspapers, there's something about whales being under attack and species dying out, and it just goes on and on and on. And when the big leaders of the world meet together, they don't manage to do very much about it. It's as if it, somehow it's not really happening. It is happening. But we can run storylines in our head that say it's not really happening, or it doesn't matter, or it will come back, or scientists will invent some drug that will revive the corpses of this, that, and the other. But they, when it's gone, it's gone. So it's the same way. Happiness has to be something apart from power, control, and attachment. Because inside these uh, ordinances, inside these organizing factors of the ego, we're always going to be telling lies. Because the world isn't the way we want it to be. And we don't want that to be the case. We want the world to be the way we want it to be. It's just like kids saying, but why should I? You say, tidy your bedroom. But why? Why should I? What's well, your bedroom. Yeah, but it's your job. Well, I don't want to. Well, I didn't ask to be born. <laughs> it's not my fault that I'm here. You made me. You tidied my bedroom. <laughs> it's so intelligent. <laughs> So we, but we are again not so different from children. They just are more honest in saying these things. So the ego is is confronted with a world that's rather problematic, but we don't want to know about problem. the The advantage of meditation is that instead of having to look outside all the time and rub our noses in these insolvable, seemingly insurmountable problems, by looking inside, you find a space and a calmness that lets everything fall into perspective and then we can confront the difficulties because we're not going to be overwhelmed by them. The ego is like a very small pot, it can't take very much. So when we look at ourselves and we see how small, inadequate, stupid we are, how many mistakes we make, there is no benefit in that. We are small so why wouldn't we be small? Blaming children for not being able to do much is, is crazy. We also are very small on the level of our ego self. So we should be kind to ourselves. Little James. Oh, it's like that. Then in the meditation, we have this sense of infinite James, infinite presence. So the finite and the infinite are inseparable. But if you forget the infinite, you put too much burden on the, on the finite, and it cannot do the job. That's why there is no happiness. And all the things that the ego, in its finite positioning, its finite sense of the world, tries to do, and most people work really, really hard at trying to make their lives work. People aren't lazy. They just do their best. But they haven't recognized the various blinkers of assumption that are on them. And they get knackered, and things go wrong, and they get disheartened and dispirited. So the Buddha's teaching is about bathing yourself in this ocean of awareness, relaxing and feeling yourself supported by these warm waters of infinite presence. So you start to recognize, oh, this is me. I belong in awareness. I am a creature of awareness. So that our infinity and our precise manifestation 
are no longer separated. And that's what it means when it says, may all beings be happy. That's what love is, is love says, welcome, come in, the water's lovely. Don't stay out there in the cold. It's too hard. There's no need. So maybe we can just look a little bit at the text and recite it together. Maybe if we recite it in the English together and then we can have a bash at the Tibetan. So, may all sentient beings have happiness and the cause of happiness. May they be free of sorrow and the cause of sorrow. May they never be separated from the happiness free of sorrow. May they abide in the equanimity free of both desire for friends and relatives and hatred towards enemies and strangers. And the Tibetan is basically a, a rhythm of one two, one two, with an occasional little shift. So we can try it all together. Sem chen tam che de wa da de we gyu dan dem ba jun chi dunya dan dunya gi ju dan chal wa jun chi dunya me pe de wa And the reason that it sometimes is uh, useful to recite it in Tibetan is that it makes just also an energetic connection to all the people who have recited this over a thousand years in Tibet. That is part of a lineage and a transmission. Because it's very easy to forget how connected we are. We're connected with all the countries in the world, but we're also connected with all of the past. So when we do something like this, it's not trying to become a foreigner or estrange ourselves. It's just allowing a foreign tongue to come through our mouths and to say, that's not something completely other than me. That's also part of my existence. And that these traditions that have been maintained for a long time, they also can be part of me because they belong to the world. Although we say Tibetan Buddhism, that's not a sort of corporate logo. You know, it, it belongs to everyone. It's Buddhism that was arose in India, went out to many countries, including Tibet. And Tibetan Buddhism is one of the streams that comes here. The Dharma belongs to everyone. It can't be owned by anyone. The Buddha said, I teach with an open hand. And the, the function of reciting these things again and again is to feel oneself supported inside making a huge aspiration. Because it's quite challenging to say, may all beings be happy. There are some people we probably think need a good slap. <laughs> and some people may well need a good slap. But so why would we want them to be happy? Well, it's because we understand why they need a good slap. What needs a slap? Their energy. The only reason to give someone a slap is to stop their energy. Punishing people after the event is stupid. You know, parents who say, right, we'll talk about this tomorrow, is the most dreadful thing. It's much better to say something directly in the moment, because then your energy is responding to their energy, hopefully with some awareness. But when we uh, recite these things, then we we bring ourselves into a connection with all beings. And the potential of all beings is relaxed and open. And if beings were living in their potential, they wouldn't be causing the trouble that makes us think they need a good slap. The, people, the reason why bad things occur 
is because people are buzzing. They're cooking inside. They're full of hatreds. Hatreds due to immediate events, but most often due to events which have happened and which have been cooked again and again and again. Ruminations, the development of cultural stereotyping, racial stereotyping and so on. So that people come to the world with very fixed definite opinions. And the solidity of that whacks into the world and causes distress and then the other people fight back and then we're full of this rage. But it's all nothing. It's just like in the summertime we, we sometimes get huge thunderstorms and then they're gone. Due to causes and conditions, the clouds gather together, the heat's there, the precipitation, and suddenly there's an electrical storm and then it's gone. If you look back through human history, we've had endless wars, endless persecution, uh, hurting people, treating them badly. And if you study history, you see causes and conditions. It's not that there are some bad people who do the bad things and everyone else is good. All of us, because we have holes in our body, are permeable. We're not eggs. You know, we've got holes, and the world comes into us. And because the world comes into us, we go out towards the world. And it's in that dynamic interchange that we feel anger, desire, jealousy, and so on. And so, the more you feel, I am a separate person, the more you're confronted with the fact that you're not in control of yourself. Because unless you want to get your ears stitched up and your eyes stitched up and stoppers up your nose and get your lips sealed, you won't be safe. Of course you would be safe for five minutes before you died, but it might be worth it. To be alive is to be connected. To be connected is to be disturbed. That's where this becomes very deep. Who is the one who's being disturbed? When the messages come from the world, who is going to receive them? If it's simply our finite self who's trying to hold themselves together, we're going to feel whacked, aren't we? We're going to feel, that person's nice, I want more of that. That person's not so nice, I want less of that. So this first verse is saying, only the infinite can survive. Clearly, if the infinite has no limits out of time and space, that's why it survives. As soon as you become finite, hopes and fears, right and wrong, and death present themselves very strongly. So this verse is very simple, but very, very profound. I want infinite goodness for all beings, and I don't want anything in return. Now why wouldn't I want anything in return? Because the only person who can really recite this verse honestly is the part of us which is completely open. May all beings be happy, but may that driver not recognize this parking space, because I want to. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, to hustling, hustling in life, you know, what about me, what about me? That bit of us needs to somehow just sit on the shelf for a bit and think, what, what, what would it mean to really want benefit for others? Really want other people to be fulfilled? Only my infinity can be so generous. And who is it being generous to? Not this nasty piece of shit. Right? Because sometimes, if we're alive, we probably do hate people. To, you, you can have a very strong conscience and prohibit yourself from feeling hate, but the, the reaction is likely to be there if we stay connected. So, somebody does something we don't like. Who has done the action? What is the root basis of that person's identity? It's the unborn dharmakaya. It's the Buddha nature. It's the natural condition which is radiant and pure from the very beginning. Out of this state, energy arises in all sorts of forms, including some which is stupid, aggressive, selfish. When we encounter that in the world, that is the energy of the enlightened state. 
Now this might sound completely nuts because we've got the crap state over here, we've got the enlightened state over here. Huh? Crap state is not good, the enlightened state is good. Now, how come this bloke saying out of the good state the crap comes? That can't be the case. Doesn't make sense. That is the logic of human beings. The nature, our own nature, when we start to examine it, and we'll do some of this in the afternoon, is without fault. There is no limit in ourselves. As it started this morning, many thoughts <coughs> arise, some good, some bad, and they all pass through. The one who experiences the thoughts, just there. Just like if on a nice day you sit in the park and you see people walking by. Some look nice, some look pretty, some are well-dressed, some are a mess, some are getting drunk. Just people passing through. Thoughts are passing through. These people are temporary residents in the park, but they don't define what the park is. Because at the end of the day, they go home and the park's there. The park can't be defined by who's in it at any one time. Would that be right? In the same way, we can't be defined by what's arising in us at any one time. In the same way, other people can't be defined by what they do at any one time. Somebody tells you about something, well, I'm not so sure. I remember last year they said that. And I, I, I have my doubts about that person. So we've now got a take on them. We've now got their number. What does that mean? This person shows so many other aspects. But we've got their number. Ah, yeah, you've got to be careful. This is where we become finite and we make the whole world small. So we're small and they're small and I'm not sure and what about you and uh -huh. And life goes by. But all these limitations are grounded in a state of openness. The limitations, when we recognize our own openness, will dissolve themselves. But even until that occurs, the limitations do not limit the ground. So, in relation to an image some of you are familiar with, if we have a mirror and we look in the mirror, we see whatever is placed in front of the mirror. It could be something very beautiful, it could be something very ugly. When the beautiful thing goes to the mirror, it doesn't make the mirror happy it doesn't make the mirror different. When the ugly thing is in front of the mirror, it doesn't spoil the mirror, it doesn't crack open, it doesn't turn itself away, it just offers a hospitality to that. If you put something very horrible in front of a mirror and you saw the reflection, hopefully we would say, that's a horrible reflection, which is true. We wouldn't say, that's a horrible mirror. You might decide, I'm going to smash that mirror, it's horrible. But that would be crazy. What you have to do is deal with what is creating the reflection. In the same way, the mirror of our mind is not determined or conditioned by the various reflections that arise, by the thoughts, feelings and sensations that come. When you identify with these reflections as if they were the true essence, as if that is who you really are, that's where the trouble begins. Because if I'm this, then what are you doing? What is that? Why do you? And immediately you're into that finite conflict. So that's a really central thing to be aware of. And you can do it in your own home. Look in the, look in the mirror. Put your hand up. Look at your nose. Take your finger up your nose. Still looking in the mirror. Oh yeah, all that's there. And the mirror is still there. What is shown is shown, it's exactly there, and then it's gone, and it leaves no trace. Now, if we think of our lives, we carry so many traces, so many marks, out of which we build these assumptions, prejudices, expectations. But if we stay fresh in the moment, we see how things are. When we introduce our assumptions and prejudices, we have constructed something 
which is not actually there. We have layered the world, we've smeared the world with something which is old, out of date, from the past. Which is why in the practice again and again we relax. Relax means let go of everything you know. Don't rely on your habitual interpretations. Just be with what's there in as simple and direct a way as possible. And then we start to just see, oh, coming and going, coming and going. I don't need to interfere. I don't need to correct. I don't need to change. <sighs> Big relaxation. Oh, it's just stuff. And then, from that state of relaxation, we come out of the meditation, moving in this world of reflections. And of course, at that point, you have to make choices. You have to speak, you have to know where you're going. But in the manner of a dream. Not so serious. Not putting all your eggs in one basket. Not thinking it's all up to me. Just energy moving in a field of energy. And that's the, the basic... Uh, the Dzogchen way of understanding the meaning of this verse. So, coming up to one o'clock, maybe time to take a break for lunch. If we meet back at three o'clock and then go from three till about six and then have a break and whoever would like to have this dinner together can, can meet at seven. Would that seem okay? Yeah. Do, do you want to... So, uh, maybe we start with a little practice. Um, this time we'll do a practice some of you know, perhaps some of you don't. It's very simple and straightforward. It follows on from what we were doing before lunch. Um, it's a practice essentially of relaxing out of the busy state of construction that we're normally in and resting in just being open. So. Many kinds of meditation are about trying to alter one's state, to improve it in some way, to develop oneself. This kind of meditation is not concerned with that at all, because it starts from the, the basic teaching, uh, which is at the heart of the practice in our lineage, that from the very beginning, the basic nature or state of all beings is pure. There is no fault in the fundamental structure of our existence. What has happened was that, as I was describing before lunch, we get caught up in the turbulence of identifications with thoughts, feelings, and sensations. And this leads to a forgetfulness of the wider infinity of our own being. Therefore, the practice is not to uh, improve oneself, to act on oneself, which would be a very dualistic positioning, but rather just to let go of identification with whatever is arising and rest in an open, spacious awareness. Then, of course, from that, many thoughts, feelings and sensations will arise. And because we strongly have the habit of identifying with them, pulling the ones we like towards us, trying to get rid of the ones we don't like, we, we tumble back into being busy again. However, with the... Uh, felt sense of relaxed spaciousness, we can observe more clearly the process of the arising and passing of the thoughts and feelings and so on. And as we see how transient they are, and we start to feel how whatever is going on, there is still a basic presence, a presence which is close to almost fused with, but not quite the same as whatever is arising, then relaxing in that awareness allows the various uh, possibilities of existence to come and go. Then from that deep openness, we can go back into coming into the world, being with others, speaking, and so on. So this process of relaxation is not to become sort of spaced out and, and passive and not involved in things, but rather it means that moment by moment when we come into activity in the world, we do it from 
a ground or a basis of relaxed spaciousness rather than self-preoccupation or constructing some kind of story about ourselves. So the way we do this, we sit in a relaxed manner and we allow our gaze to rest in the space in front of us, maybe a couple of arms lengths out from where you're sitting. We're not staring at something other than ourselves, but the gaze is open, so you see the, the room, the walls of the room, perhaps people's heads and so on. But the focus is just this open spaciousness. And in our heart also there is an open spaciousness around which all sorts of thoughts and feelings move. So, with that sense of the spaciousness, we recite this sound of ah three times. We're using ah as a sound just to release our identification, just to let go of whatever it is we're caught up in. Ah symbolizes emptiness, shunyata, uh, state in which there is no substantial essence to everything, to anything. Because if things were very strongly real, then Relaxing wouldn't make any difference. All it would mean is you go into some kind of personal holiday space in your head. But as he said in all the Buddhist teachings, all forms are like an illusion. They have no inherent self-nature. They are held in place by our own energy of construction. So when we do this practice, although it's very simple, it's very deep, very infinite, just relax and open we start to see that all the familiar phenomena out of which we construct our seemingly solid world are transient and passing by. So we just do the three R and sit relaxed in that state for some time. And if you feel, oh, nothing's changed, I'm just sitting in a room, I don't know what's going on, what is this? Just very gently try to be aware, oh, these are thoughts. If you fall into the thought, the thought will tell you the truth about your world. But if you relax a bit and just recognize, oh, this is a thought. This is what the thought tells me. But it's just like watching advertising on the telly. You know, when you've been around the block a few times, you don't believe what they tell you. You just think, oh, they're trying to sell me stuff. In the same way, when these thoughts <coughs> arise in your mind, it's trying to say, believe in me. Ah. We sit calm and it goes by. So we just sit in that state. Okay? Ah. That's a practice that's very straightforward to do. It's useful not to do it for too long a time. Um, just till you get into the, the way of doing it. But one of the things it can help you to see is how you are a participant in the creation of this world moment by moment. Because say for example, you're sitting, your eyes are open and you look and you, you, you see something in front of you, maybe this awning here, or somebody's face, or some color, or flowers, whatever it is. And you think, well, nothing's changed, this is just a flower. In that moment, you think you're giving a description to something which is existing in itself, 
but actually the very naming of the flower helps to create the flower. Everything in this room is in culture. Even things which are growing in pots are here because somebody has bought them, they bought them for a reason, but in this culture we think these kind of leaves are nice to look at. These are articles which have been constructed by other people, but in our very recognition of what they are, we are also co-constructing them. We are saying this is a painting, and if we know something about these Tibetan deities, we say it's this kind of god or that kind of god. In that moment where you recognize what the painting is, it appears to you that what you think it is, is in the painting. That your recognition is coming after the fact of what is there. But actually, it's the construct in yourself which is operating with little pieces of paint on a piece of cloth to create the sense, this is a goddess, this is the Buddha, whatever. And when you start to recognize this, the whole balance of the world shifts. Because without you, this world wouldn't be here. You yourself create your own car. When you go to your motor car, your mind says, this is my car. You know about that car. You know where the keys are. Who is doing that? You are doing that. You yourself are working with the potential of what is there to bring it into being. The object doesn't come alive by itself. Without your lively participation, it would have no meaning. That is to say, meaning is in the subject, it's not in the object. Without the participation of the subject, the object just sits there. So, when you start to see that, in the meditation, especially if we practice with our eyes open, the familiar objects are being held there because you are still running a stream of identifying thoughts which hold them in place. And the more you go into the practice, the sense of shape and structure of these objects starts to relax. Things start to move more, you see pulsations of color and so on. That is to say, the fundamental building blocks of the world start to become evident to you. Colors, sounds. The colors become forms and familiar objects because of the act of your cognition. This is something quite radical because it means you're not living in a dead world. You're living in a world which only comes alive, which is alive through participation. So when you assume that things exist in themselves, that they have a, a self-existing essence of their own, you can just leave them where they are as if they would be the same yesterday and tomorrow. But when you start to see them as manifesting in relation to your own mood, to how you are at different times of the day. So if you've had some lunch, you might be feeling a bit sleepy. That sleepiness will cause you to be in this room in a different way from how you might have been first thing in the morning. Now you could say that's a secondary characteristic on top of the fact, well, the room is just the room. Who says the room is just the room? I do. Why do I say that? Because I want to believe that I haven't been taking something like LSD. You know? Oh my God, it's all going wrong. It's not like that. It's like how we enter into the world, what we say about it, causes the world to reveal itself in different ways. That's not very mysterious. Children, again, are the best way of understanding this. If you play with children, if you are harsh on them, they will behave in a particular way. If you're sweet with them, they'll show another way. And so, if you're, if you're angry with the child, the child will probably become defensive or hurt. They don't have so many options. And then you have a reaction to how they are. And then they have a reaction to how you are. Action, reaction keeps tumbling along. The child, that is to say, is an energetic potential that reveals itself into the environment according to the shaping of the environment. And the environment responds to what it takes to be a child 
in terms of how the child reveals itself. That is to say, our world is dynamic and interactive. We are not entities fixed in some place, but potentials which are always moving into an intercourse, into a, a moving together which is transformational. So, in the meditation, the work is to keep relaxing the reliance on the fixed view of what things are. Instead of always telling the world what it is, we want to relax and receive how things are. And when we allow that to happen, we get a different sort of experience. Because as long as we are telling, all we are doing is rewriting our history onto the present moment rewriting our assumptions and prejudices, seeking to incorporate what is fresh and new and open into something which is habitual and usual. And when we do that, life becomes, on the one hand, rather safe, rather cozy, not so challenging, but it also moves towards being a bit dead, a bit flat. So if we want things to stay alive, we have to walk around them not live in a two-dimensional relationship like looking at a painting, but seeing the people we know, parents, children, lovers and so on, as sculptures and moment by moment walk around them. Let them reveal themselves from different standpoints. The advantages of that are the world becomes richer, but also you get used to moving. And you come to see that all we ever have is the view from here wherever here is. That is all you ever have. So, where am I? If where you are is sitting inside your assumptions, that's the view you'll have. And if you have very rigid, uh, dogmatic assumptions, you will develop the confidence things are as they should be. Hmm. Because they always look the same. Hmm. I'm somebody who knows a lot about life. Because when I look, I see the same thing. Hmm. That's pretty good. But that's occurring to you because you always look from the same position. If you allow yourself to move, you see it's moving. Actually, you've always been moving, but you've been running on the spot. You run on the spot, it looks the same, but you're still moving. You can't stop moving. Everything is dynamic. Okay, so let's return to the text, and we're looking at the second verse now. So it's saying, may all sentient beings be free of sorrow and the cause of sorrow. <coughs> so what is, what is sorrow or suffering? It means something that, <laughs> something that troubles us. Things can trouble us on various levels. They can trouble us on the level of the body when we have physical pain. They can trouble us on the emotional <laughs> level when we don't feel settled in ourselves. Generally speaking, trouble is the quality that manifests when there's a divergence between how we would like things to be and how things are. things seem to be going wrong, or they're not quite right, or other people don't go along with our point of view, and we feel a bit disturbed. We don't feel safe, because we're looking for the continuity of the past through the present into the future. Then we feel safe. This kind of safety doesn't really exist. Who, anyone here had a life like that? Tomorrow is the same as today and the same as yesterday? It's not really possible. Something will always happen. External things will happen. Internal things will happen. So, if suffering arises because something is happening that I don't want to be happening, where is the problem? Now, it's pretty easy to know where the problem is. The problem's out there. 
if only these arseholes got their ass in gear, my life would be better. If they sorted themselves out and stopped hassling me, things would be good. Blaming and judging is very quick. If you see the problem in the object, it has the advantage that something to, can be done. You mobilize your energy and tr you try to change the object field. But somehow, it never quite works out. Somehow, there's always some extra little thing that hasn't quite come into place. So in chasing the object, we become tired. Why am I suffering? Because how I am. Now, you could turn that into a guilty blaming, but that's not the point here. It's simply to say how I am. Again, not who I am. It's not saying there is something wrong with me, but there is something not very useful in how, in the particular patterning which I am bringing to being in the world. So, for example, I work in the NHS, and we have a lot of management decisions which come down to us. Many of these decisions I don't particularly agree with, I don't particularly like, but the, the big people who make these decisions are not very interested in someone like me, so I'm required just to be a good boy and do as I'm told. Even if I'm a very good boy and I do exactly as I'm told, we still have problems. Why? Because this is samsara. Samsara is a domain where you get a lot of problems. Hmm? That's what you get. We're born into a world that's full of problems. There's problems in America, there's problems in Africa, there ain't no place where you don't get problems. In some countries they don't have any food. In some countries children don't have any shoes. But there isn't a country in the world where people don't have problems. Even in millionaires in America, in their sort of guarded compounds where they have plenty to eat and so on, they also have problems. Why do they have problems? Why is it that rich, healthy, beautiful people have problems? One reason is to provide interesting stories for Hello Magazine. <laughs> If they didn't have any problems, what would we be able to laugh about? So we're very grateful. But the reason they have problems is because they have this seed of problems inside them, which is very similar to what we looked at this morning. The root cause of suffering is not being able to be present with life as it is. To be out of time and out of place. To be imagining that our sense of how things should be is important. And so, for example, because I've worked in the NHS quite some time, I can think that our little department has something to do with me. But the fact is I am a public servant, which means that it belongs to the public. I have no right of control over anything whether it's the computer programs or the data that we collect or the length of treatment that's offered to the patients. This is determined by other people. The Buddha explained this in terms of dependent co-origination. He said that we, we live in this incredibly interlinked matrix where there are many different vortices, many different turning, spinning wheels of energy which interact with each other. And whenever you try to draw a little boundary out around your own existence and think, aha, uh -huh, inside this frame, I can stabilize the situation, I can be in charge, this is an illusion. This is not how it is. Because the, the actions of other people affect our lives. We know this on a broader scheme, that the people who cut down the hardwood forests in the Amazon and in Indonesia are affecting the world climate, which affects us. We know that when new factories burning coal start in China, that affects the world climate, which affects us. What other people do and our existence are linked together. So whenever I try to think, yeah, but our little department should do things the right way, that's to imagine that somehow I'm in charge of what's going on. 
So even if you have the title that you're the person who's in charge, this is an illusion. What is actually going on is the constant interweaving of factors, most of which you don't see. They seem to be invisible, but they're dynamically operating. So, the decision to encourage uh, the city of London to expand because it brought a lot of tax revenues in, the fear that the Labour Party carries to uh, be accused of being anti-business, many, many factors like that came into the deregulation of the city, which fed into absorbing huge amounts of bad debt, which fed into the collapse of the economy, which feeds into Gordon Brown bailing the banks out, which feeds into a huge national debt, which feeds into there being no money for the NHS, which feeds into a lot of planning coming into our little department, which is about cutbacks. These are cutbacks which you could say have nothing to do with the need for public services, but they have to do with the fact that everything is connected. Everything is connected. You can't ring fence any space in this world and keep other people out. That's quite shocking. So how will I be safe? How will I be safe? Now we see in the local elections, many more people were voting for the British National Party with a sense, if we keep foreigners out, then we will be safe. But how could that keep you safe? Because most of the white British people are pretty damn foreign to me. They don't share my values. So who is going to be like me? What sort of island am I going to live on? Wandering around looking, are you like me? Are you like me? Who will I be with? Who is the same and who is different? It's a very big question. Who is the enemy? Who is undermining my sense of being me? Well, the answer is everyone. Because everyone we meet invites us to become slightly different. As soon as you actually respond to anyone, you move into a different mode. If you move into a different mode, you aren't who you were just before. So everybody is changing us all the time. What we carry, though, is the illusion of a continuous self, a self which can be known, a self which we can give an account of. This is not how it is. So, if we say, may all beings be free of suffering, what could we do to remove the suffering of others? First of all, we need to understand ourselves what suffering is. Otherwise, how can we help other people? Because some people will say, I'm suffering because I'm hungry. Okay, you can give them some food. After a while, you ask, are you still suffering? Yes, I'm suffering. Well, now I have food, but I don't have a house. Okay, we give you a house. Now, how are you? Well, I'm still suffering because my children don't have a school. So now you have food clothing, house, school for the children. Now what's the matter? Oh, my wife's upset because she doesn't have enough gold bangles. Okay, now we'll give you gold bangles. Now what's happening? Well, my wife who's got gold bangles has got a bit fat and ugly, so I don't want to have sex with her. Oh my God, what can we do? So like that, where, where, where will sufferings come to an end? As long as you think the source of my happiness is in the object, and if only I get the object right, suffering will go away. I'm going around the same territory again and again. I hope you can see that. Because it's just the same essential point. Relying on the object brings grief. Because the object is unreliable. Now, the only way to not rely on the object is to start to get to know who you are. Because aspects of ourselves are always object-related. When we come into our embodied self in the world with others, we are always in connection with other people. Even if you go into a long retreat, you're still connected with others. So the fundamental thing is to relax into the state of the unborn awareness, which is not resting on your own personal history, on the behavior of external people in the world. It's just open and present. Then the interactions continue. Because the root cause of suffering 
is the hope that I will be able to stop things occurring, things which I call bad, unpleasant, and I will be able to have more things which I consider to be good. How do we stop bad things happening? Maybe we need more power, maybe we need no money, maybe we need a change of government. Will that stop bad things happening? Probably not. Powerful people also have sick children. Powerful people also get cancers. Worldly power doesn't stop bad things happening. Money can't buy happiness in that way. Money can take you to a nice restaurant or give you lots of holidays, but it can't stop bad things happening. So, when we say, may all beings be free of suffering, how, how could you have a life free of suffering? It goes back to the example we used at the end just of the morning just before lunch, the image of the mirror. When you look in the mirror, the reflection seems to be inside the mirror, but it doesn't affect the mirror. When the object causing the reflection is moved away from the mirror, the reflection leaves the mirror instantly. Now, if you have a piece of paper and you put uh, some paint on it, the paint will be absorbed into the paper and then it's difficult to get it out. Our ego self, our ordinary sense of self, is like paper. It's absorbent. We take the world into us. We get touched, moved, changed. Our feelings go up and down according to circumstances. But the nature of our awareness is like the mirror. Whatever occurs doesn't scratch it, doesn't break it, doesn't harm it, doesn't mark it permanently. Events arise and then they're gone. It, that state is the state which is free of suffering. It doesn't mean that there is no suffering. It means that we are not conditioned or marked by the suffering. Because externally, of course suffering occurs. I mean, the Tibetans lost their country. Lots of them have lost their relatives. Many were tortured, lived in poverty for a long time. They had to do difficult things. It would be uh, insane to say uh, these people don't suffer. Well, would it? What they've had is certainly plenty of reasons for suffering. The question is, who has received the reason for suffering? On the level of being a human being interacting in the world, if you say, how was it to lose your country, it's not likely that many would, people would say, it was wonderful. Most people would say, that wasn't very nice. But it couldn't be very nice. The question would be, how marked is the person in relation to that? How many feelings of anger, of revenge, of misery do you hear? Usually, certainly in my experience, uh, with uh, Tibetan teachers, if they're describing what happened, they're just describing it. Like, these things happened. It's, that is to say, they were there, they were present, these things happened. They're not saying, these were dreadful, the Chinese are dogs, you know, we need revenge. They're not saying anything like that. They're just saying, bad things happened for a while. Now bad things aren't happening, so what shall we do now? And this is the essential point of moving to have freedom from suffering. Not that the object goes away, but that suffering as an event, of course, will occur. Bad things will happen. We feel insulted or we get sick or whatever. But all events arise and pass in moments of time. They're there and then they're not there. What is it that causes the continuity of an event in yourself? Why is it that I'm sure everyone in this room can think about some bad thing that's happened to them in the past, maybe some betrayal or some sickness 
or getting losing a job, some mark that still feels alive inside. Who is doing that? The event is gone. It will not come back. That particular war is over. But we are still hot towards that event. We haven't let it cool. It hasn't just become neutral. That happened. It's still, that happened to me and I don't like it. And let me tell you in detail why. <laughs> because it's very interesting and very important. And in that way, it's cooking and cooking and cooking. So, maybe we just take a, a few minutes to try to reflect on some events in your life that, although they're gone historically, are not gone for you, that you're still caught up in. And then try to, to share what you think you do to keep it alive. Try to share that with someone sitting next to you. If you don't want to talk about the details of the event, you don't have to. The most interesting thing is, what is your role in keeping that event hot and alive inside you? See if you can get a sense of that. Okay. Seem to be a lot of energy in that. <laughs> Did you come to any conclusions about what you're up to? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a lot of it going on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a central theme in Buddhism about how to drop these preoccupations, I mean, it's explicit in a great deal of Zen Buddhist practice when they talk of dropping the mind, but that the mind that's meant there is exactly the mind that is preoccupied <clears throat> with thoughts of the past and thoughts of the future, where the storylines that we've woven our fixed sense of self out of come almost like a, a, an umbilical cord to strangle us if we can't get free of it properly. And uh, just letting go. I mean, every religion has practices of uh, recognition when we've done wrong things and repentance, remorse, and purification. And they usually have practices of forgiveness as well. And uh, there's a good reason for this. That as long as we are preoccupied, as long as we have that sort of unfinished business, there are these sort of tendrils moving inside us, and they can latch on to new situations, especially where we feel it's more of the same. It can easily f feed into generalized conclusions. All dot, dot, dot are like that. All men are bastards, or all, you know, whatever it would be. There's a lot of people who believe that. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps with some reason. <laughs> but when you have a conclusion like that, then the knowledge is going in advance of your experience. Of course, we, t we put it in advance to try to protect our experiences because, you know, once bitten, twice shy, because that's happened to me, I'm not going to let it happen again. And that sounds quite wise. I'm going to take care. But that very wariness closes down the possibilities that we have for being connected with the world. And so... It's not that in dropping the mind we make ourselves somehow naive and vulnerable. It's like I'm going to drop these assumptions and my protection, instead of it being some shield in front of me, will be that I'm here and I'm light on my feet. I'm going to move with the circumstances. I'm not going to sit there like a stookie and get slapped about. I'm going to kind of come into a flexible responsiveness with situations. And of course, in order to do that, 
we have to feel enabled and empowered to mobilize our energy quickly into the situation. So when we've been hurt in the past, one of the things it can establish is states of anger and aggression, but also fear and dread, and also the passivity of a kind of victimhood, where having been caught once and popped in a box, objectified, we imagine that can happen again. But in that very protective, I won't let it happen, we're still somehow maintaining that sense I am somebody that the world whacks. I am a victim. That is to say, I am an object that gets caught. So what's happened to my vibrant living sense of subjectivity when I come to inhabit that space? It's forgotten about. And I'm starting to believe other people are big and powerful and they know what's what, and I'm the small one. I'm the, thing, the one that things happen to. And that position really is not... You don't... <laughs> In that position, you don't see very much, so you can't take care of yourself. So, dropping these fixations of the past actually help us to come and inhabit our own size. Now, what is our size? When we go into the practice, our size is infinite. There is no limit to our awareness, because everything that occurs, occurs in the field of the unborn awareness. And also, there is no limit to how we can be. Who is stopping us doing what other people do? Ourselves. We take on scripts that determine we should be the quiet one, or we should be the joker one. And living inside these scripts, all the other potentials, which were there when we were small, remain not fully evolved. They're sort of nascent. They're, they're, they're potentials, but they don't come into the fullness of their being. Which is again why having a very separated sense of one's own existence doesn't help. Because when we look at other people, we think, oh, they can do that, you can do that, you're able to do it, but I couldn't. And what I'm doing there is I'm reaffirming my sense of who I am in terms of your qualities, which is on the sort of ontological sense, level, on the level of defining uh, my being, who I am, that means one thing, but I'm also crushing myself and demeaning myself at the same time. Whereas the more we experience each other as shared inhabitants of this world, and that we have so much in common, then if you can do it, why couldn't I do it? And in that sense, to fulfill ourselves is also an invitation to other people to fulfill themselves. Because we're saying, well, if I can do it, you can do it. What is this kind of brand across your forehead that says you're a done deal, you're already fixed and in place and we know who you are? So non-duality is about the free movement of inspiration and energy between all the nodal points of the shared manifestation. You know, it's one infinite space and in it we all arise and each of us for ourselves is the central point. If we know how to inhabit that central point, we don't have to displace other people. Nobody can move us out of our central point if we stay present in it. Even if they have a lot of socio-economic political power over us, we're still here in the middle. And if we are really grounded, we can allow other people to be central. Everybody can be the radiant center of the universe. Because that's what energy does. It comes out from the source and manifest in these ways. And then after a while it goes back in, that's what we call death, and then it comes out again. It's, energy's always pulsing, but the key thing is to recognize the ground and in, to integrate into it. So it's a very important thing to observe how much of my past I'm carrying on my shoulders. How much I burden myself with the knowledge I've had. That is to say, when we have experiences, good ones or bad ones, we learn something from them. We can keep that knowledge nearby. We can keep it to hand, available. But we don't need to hold it. Because as soon as we're holding something, it's closing our capacity to act down. I mean, that's what a prejudice is. 
It's a foreclosure. It's a closure which has happened before the next moment. So when we have a prejudice or an assumption, we hold it in the way I've got this clock in my hands, and there's not much I can do with my hands now because I've got a clock in it. If I put the clock here, I can still see the clock, but my hands are free. And that's the difference between having knowledge as a resource or a tool and being caught up in something so that we are being determined and conditioned by the event. So the fact that perhaps people have been cruel to us or we've been cruel to others, the fact that other people have burned us with their jealousy or we've burned them with ours, all of these experiences can be spread around us like resources which can be mobilized. So in this uh, Nyingmapa tradition, we uh, look a lot at Padmasambhava. Uh, Padmasambhava is represented by this big statue over here on my right, on the left of the room. And he is said to be surrounded by many Dakinis. Dakinis are uh, wisdom beings, they're goddesses, they represent the movement of energy. And he sits like a good old-fashioned man. He sits on his bum, and the girly whirlies run around and do things. <laughs> ah, the good old days before this obscenity of feminism cast a dark shadow across our world. <laughs> but what it really means is, because Padma Sambhava is there not particularly male, what it means is that you yourself, your awareness sits like Padma Sambhava, never moving. Awareness doesn't change, but your thoughts, feelings, and sensations move around. Now, when we do the practice and we relax, we, we become aware of many different kinds of thoughts and feelings. You don't need to do anything about them. They just move by themselves. But should it be required, they can be mobilized. And then act, your activity comes into the world. So it's exactly the same with your own experience. The fact that maybe you've been cheated, cheated in business, cheated in love, had difficult kids, that through that you learn something. You learn something about the structure of the world, about how people are. If you allow that to be a resource, which is to hand, you can be very relaxed. And should the situation arise, when this information is useful, you can mobilize it straight through you. Should that situation not arise, you can just let, leave it there in orbit. It's moving around. But what happens when we, we feel something shouldn't have happened, or that we're to blame, is that it creates a kind of glue that makes a, a preoccupation, a filling up of ourselves with these events. And then we become constrained and unable to freshly respond into the situation. Because, of course, what has happened in the past can provide some insight or some illumination to a current situation, but it can't give us exactly the right reading. Because each new situation is going to be new. That's why we have to take the past event like a tool and use it carefully. Just as when we learn to write, if we're writing some notes for ourselves, we can scroll, and if we're writing for someone else, we write more carefully, because we realize they maybe can't read our ordinary writing. So, when an event has happened, if we're going to make use of it, we have to cook it or transform it to bring it into a meaningful relationship with the present moment. Which is why, if we're hanging on to it too tightly, if we think we've got the truth about a situation, we're not going to want to change it, because we already know it. they're like that. They shouldn't do that. And that very vehemence closes you down, because you just want to get revenge. And revenge is the most stupid thing, because the thing you want revenge for is gone. It's really gone. What's lingering on is your inability to allow the world to be the way it is. Life is unfair. Bad things will happen to all of us. That's just how it is. We see other people 
we seem to have happier lives. We think, oh, how did they get that? Why isn't my life fulfilled? Well, it isn't. But maybe the thing that really makes our life not fulfilled is that we keep looking at other people and trying to work out what kind of life they have. If you just eat what's on your own plate, if you stay close to your own existence in your own skin, then from that position, whatever you get is workable. So maybe you become sick, maybe you lose some of your mobility. If you're in that, you're having your existence as it is. And if you have to walk more slowly down the road, you will see more. You will see the architecture more clearly. You will be, have time to cl slowly walk and peep in people's windows. <laughs> and if they stare out at you, just wave your stick. Oh. <laughs> there are many advantages, however you are. But if you've got a game plan in your head, this is how my life should be, and now it isn't. It's very difficult to be in your own skin. Because this isn't the skin I should be in. I should be having another life. So, in this way we can see that the root of suffering is not the moments of hurt and pain which arise, but is attachment to them through a self-referential reading that says, this shouldn't have happened, I deserve more than this, I'm entitled to a better life. And that that dense centering causes the events to keep whirling, not around us, but right through us, so that we are constrained in how we can approach things. Now this is clearly, if we're saying, may all beings have this, they must have the potential for this, which takes us back to what we looked at before. It's the Buddha nature, or the unborn nature, which is present in all beings, which is the basis for their awakening. This is not created by being a good boy or a good girl. You don't make the Buddha nature out of good deeds, out of being kind. But it's easier to awaken to it if you're not so full of intense negative thoughts. Neither good thoughts nor bad thoughts make the Buddha nature. Buddha nature is the unborn natural condition. So when we say may all beings have freedom from suffering and the root of suffering, this is, this is the, the definition of compassion. Compassion means having the thought to free all beings from suffering and developing the means. First of all, we have to understand that for ourselves. We have to be able to enter into a state where we are so close to suffering that it looks as if it's going to get us, but it doesn't. Some of you may know that movie, The Matrix. And in the end of the first one, when the, the guy is shooting the bullets at him, he starts slowing down and slowing down and then he starts speeding up. And as his speed gets proximate to the speed of the bullet, he's able to see the bullet coming and just dodge it out of the way. So the bullet is very close, but he doesn't get hurt. And his fear drops. And that's at the heart of trusting the practice, that all the suffering, all the bad events of the world will still be there, when you read about something bad in the papers or a friend tells you some bad news, you can still cry. You're not going to get turned into a zombie. But there is a freedom from enmeshment because this is happening and it's gone. This is happening and it's gone. That's the fact. Bad times come. We can be there, we can feel them fully, and then they're gone. Good times come, feel them fully, and they're gone. Good times won't last forever, bad times don't last forever. If you're fully in it, you get the taste, you know what suffering is. Then your belly can really resonate with the suffering of others. But resonating with them inside the spaciousness that allows you to be fully present with someone in their pain with the infinite confidence, and it won't last. You don't necessarily have to say that out of your mouth, because it all sounds a bit like a platitude. But if you hold it inside yourself, you can give them that full meeting in their sorrow, 
without going into a collusion with it, without turning it into something solid, but by fully accepting it, they live the pain, and then it releases. And then there's something else. And then there's something else. So, again, openness and the pulsations of our existence, moment by moment, are inseparable. And the paradox is that we can be more in the moment, in the world with others, the more relaxed and spacious we are. And the more we try hard, the more we pull ourselves together, because we're separating ourselves from the world, we are trying hard to build this bridge towards the other. But the other is already there. When we meet people, they're just there. There's no big wall between us. They're just, hello, it's just there. So that's really why relaxation is so very important. Should we take a wee break there in this rather sauna-like room? Okay, <clears throat> so the third uh, aspect here is may all sentient beings never be separated from the happiness free of sorrow. So it's saying that there's a kind of happiness that has no sorrow mixed in with it. Again, you see that a lot in children. When children are very happy, their joy uh, spreads out and they don't feel <coughs> any uh, limit to that. As adults, it's usually much more difficult to really trust, to open into a situation and experience the full impact of it. Well, we tend to sit a bit of us on the, on the sidelines watching things, not quite fully committing ourselves. So, in being about joy, this is about how to enter into a state where happiness and suffering don't contradict each other. So usually they're like chalk and cheese, they're oppositional in some way. As I said, this verse is seen as a kind of definition of joy. But joy is impermanent. What is possible to maintain is satisfaction. In the Dzogchen tradition, being at peace with oneself, being relaxed in a state of openness, is not elevated by happiness and it's not diminished by sorrow. It's a satisfaction which continues all the time. In that sense, again, it's like the state of the mirror. The mirror doesn't change whatever is arising. Nowadays, there's a bit of a cult of happiness. In many uh, famous Buddhists are selling happiness. And they get workshops on happiness, endless books on happiness. And uh, even psychologists are wanting to enter into this uh, lucrative endeavor. <laughs> but uh, happiness is very elusive. We're happy for a while. Then we're a bit sad. The idea that people could be permanently happy, and you see all these spiritual leaders with this rictus smile in every photo, <laughs> blessing, this is uh, unhealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Something a little bit suspect about it. Because what it means is that they have their own position. They have an, their own internal means of being happy irrespective of what's happening. So in that sense, it's essentially masturbatory, that they're exciting themselves in a particular way to induce this state. But to be connected with the world is to have sorrow. How could one not read a newspaper and be free of sorrow? Bad things happen. They happen in our world. This is our existence. Even if it's in another country, it's happening to us if we're there. So, again, we have to always try to see what's the deeper meaning of these words. Because on the surface level, of course it makes sense. If everyone could be happy all the time and there wasn't any sorrow, we'd all be in la-la land and it would be very nice. Hello, 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 hello. But 
our existence isn't like that. As far as we know, it's never been like that on Earth. There have always been differences in health, in longevity, in access to financial resources, survival and so on, freedom. So, if we want to give this joy to all beings, then in a sense we have to transport them to some other place. And in the Buddhist tradition, particularly in the Mahayana tradition, they have the idea that there are Buddha realms, Buddha realm in the West, the most famous, Sukhavati or um, Dewachen, a land where everything is perfect. As soon as you're born there, you hear beautiful music playing all the time, the teachings of the Buddha resonate out of all the trees and the flowers, everything is exquisitely, aesthetically pleasing, and the heart is content. Where is this place? Not here. <laughs> Somewhere, but not here. Not available at the moment. We hope to have a delivery soon. <laughs> Please stay in touch. <laughs> Why somehow the delivery doesn't arrive. It's like the Messiah. Soon to be with us, but uh, not yet. Because the word Messiah means the yet to come. And these realms are realms of uh, possibility, but they're realms which don't arrive here. Now, what stops them being here? The fact that we are connected. Either everybody has a good time, or nobody has a good time. So in our realm, everybody gets some distress. To live in this realm, in order to have a happiness which is unalloyed, unmixed with suffering, what would that mean? The happiness that we can have is the happiness of being at home in ourselves, living in our own skin, being at peace with our lives. That is to say, to have learned the difference between the phenomenological aspect of existence, that is to say, existence as it actually presents itself, and the incredible capacity that we have for creative elaboration. Our imagination is fantastic. All the developments in science, medicine, agriculture that transform so much of the world, this is the creative imagination in process. However, our imagination also leads us into a displacement from what is here. Because if life here is difficult, mostly what we do is we imagine how it could be different and then seek to mobilize our energy to create that different world so that it will provide relief from the one that we feel trapped in. From the point of view of meditation, this is not so useful because, as I indicated earlier, once you change one thing, there's another thing to be changed, and then there's another and another. There's no end to making changes to make a better world. It doesn't mean that we should be completely quietistical and not do anything at all, but it's acting in the manner of a dream, realizing that whatever environment you create there will still be room for suffering because, as we looked earlier, suffering doesn't come from the object. For example, we have the story of the princess and the pea. Once upon a time, there was a beautiful princess. When this princess was young, there was a terrible tragedy. And in order to protect her, her parents gave her away and she was brought up by poor country folk. And she lived a very nice life in a little cottage deep in the forest. She had no idea what the big outside world was made of, but she was a good girl and contented to help her parents, the, the simple people who she took to be her real parents. One day, while out hunting, a handsome prince rode by, and he came to this little hut, and he saw this beautiful girl, and he thought, Oh, she's so gorgeous. I want to marry her. So he put her on the back of his horse and rode back to the palace. But when they got there, his mother said, 
What's this little tart? <laughs> <laughs> She's not a princess. And he said, Mother, look at her face. Look how sweet she is. Look how kind she is. I'm sure you'll get to love her. No, I won't. <laughs> so she said, she can spend one night in the guest room, but I'm not having any of it. In fact, clearly the cream's a bit common somehow in this story. <laughs> <laughs> so that night, this little country girl lay down on the bed. She couldn't move. So she goes, this bed is very uncomfortable. So she asked, could she get another mattress and another mattress? By the morning, she had ten mattresses. No rest at all. The queen said the next morning, how did you sleep, my dear? She said, well, it's terrible. These beds are really uncomfortable. I have a better bed back in the village. And the queen said, oh, to be able to feel a pee through so many mattresses, this is a sign you're a princess. You may marry my son. <laughs> now, the meaning of this is, even if you get everything, you can still suffer. Even if you've got ten mattresses and you're not contented. Yeah, it should do well in our royal family. <laughs> I'm not a royalist. <laughs> so how, if we understand this principle, we ourselves can introduce dissatisfaction into any situation. We have to look, what is it that will cause me to spoil the happiness that comes? Who is the one who is mixing the suffering with the happiness? It's not an external event. This is something I am doing. Now, one way we can do it is we have a good situation and we want it to last forever. We don't want it to change. And then because we become aware that it is going to change, even before it's ended, we start to not really be able to inhabit it. So real happiness from this point of view, means being able to really be in whatever comes. This is very interesting, because as long as we say the quality of the object determines my happiness, clearly I cannot inhabit a moment which is overtly, manifestly unpleasant, with as much happiness as I inhabit one which is overtly, manifestly happy. That's obvious, isn't it? If you eat something nice, that's delicious. If you eat something not so nice, it's oh, it's a kind of... So, how could you be happy under both these circumstances? It goes back to this central point. Who is the one who is having the experience? Our ego self, which is composed of its conditioned responses, which creates a particular profile, moves always towards the world in terms of what confirms its profile or disconfirms its profile. That is to say, we're always seeking reassurance that we're okay. So when we have experiences we don't like, we have an aversion to them. When we have experiences that we like, we feel that this is a kind of... Um, confirmation of our validity and we want them affirmed. This aspect of our experience will not know real happiness. It's the aspect of our experience that always longs for happiness, that makes so much effort to try to create happiness, but he never gets it. And it just can't because it's not in its repertoire. Its repertoire is to be dynamic and moving and changing and therefore an enduring happiness couldn't belong to it. So when we observe ourselves and we see that moment by moment our thoughts, feelings and sensations are changing, that what we take to be ourselves is constructed out of the ceaselessly moving juxtaposition of habitual patterns, that a bit like a child's kaleidoscope, you turn it around, you turn it around, each turn you get a new pattern. From morning to night, pattern after pattern after pattern is arising, and we move towards these patterns saying, this is me, this is me, this is me. Clearly something as unstable as that 
couldn't have a permanent happiness. Yet, who is the one looking at the kaleidoscope? Who is the one now happy, now sad? When we are merged in the content of our experience, when we feel this is happening to me, we've nowhere to turn. So if it's good, it's ha ha ha, and if it's sad, it's oh. No. But who is this one who is having the feeling? Because there is the participant aspect, the involved, touched aspect, and the aware, present aspect. So the, the purpose of the meditation is just to tilt back on a kind of fulcrum, away from an over-involvement, over-investment in the intensity of the moment, to something relaxed that offers hospitality to the moment, but doesn't fuse with it. That is the basis of the enduring happiness. Because it means that the quality of openness and attention is there to whatever is arising. That whatever occurs is a guest. Guests come and go in the hotel of our existence. The hotel the open space, traditionally it's called the Dharma Dhatu, Chukying, means that the space of all phenomena is always open. 24 hours a day, that hotel will welcome whatever occurs. But the phenomena which come in and go out, they're very fleeting. Very fleeting. So this is why we do the meditation practice, to awaken to this dimension of ourselves, which is infinite, unchanging, and open to everything. It is this aspect which is always already enlightened, always already awakened. It is this aspect which has enduring contentment. The ego is also an aspect of our nature. It's not the full story, it's just a nexus, a little patterning, a turning point of our energy. And it has a very different experience. So, again, if you ask your ego to do something it can't do, this is terrible. We are all guilty of ego abuse. This is a new category and social workers are planning on how they can introduce it. And the result is this, is that social workers will call, call on your house at 5 o'clock in the morning and they'll take your ego away. <laughs> you will be left enlightened. Because the ego is able to function doing certain tasks. It's very good. The ego can work out how to do a tax return. The ego's worry is useful for remembering to do a proper shop before a bank holiday weekend and so on. It keeps you on task, but it's not who you really are. It's a, it's a set of capacities, a set of functions. And the over-identification with this patterning of energy causes, as we looked before, the forgetfulness of being, the forgetfulness of the relaxed infinite state. So this is the, the real meaning in this verse. It's not going to some other land where everything is happy, happy all the time, but of resting in your own nature, which is able to be at ease with whatever occurs. But remember, at ease doesn't mean indifferent. It doesn't mean anesthetized. It means being with what's there. So it's a, it's a multiple level, simultaneous presence. We're present as open space, we're present as the whole field of arising, and we're present with this specific moment, which has its full flavor, happy or sad. It's really not about being a zombie, it's not about being spaced out, it's not about going off into some transcendental realm. It's about allowing the absolute precision of being in the world with others to be experienced, integrated in the ground spaciousness, which ceaselessly unties the knots. As soon as you connect with another, you lock into something, 
and then it unties, and then it unties, and then it unties. So that instead of having to protect ourselves against what the world might be, we can be open into the situation with the increasing confidence, and it goes free, and it goes free. So somebody's unpleasant to you, or somebody's very charming to you, oh, and gone, oh, and gone. Rather than, oh, what does that mean? Building it up, building it up. Okay, shall we do a little more practice? We do this three-hour practice again. <coughs> and we can make the, the different versions of this you can do. So this time, we can imagine in front of us uh, a ball of rainbow-colored light. A little bit like uh, this kind of uh, bubbles that children blow with washing up liquid, shining. And in the center of it, we imagine a letter R. You can use the Tibetan letter, or you can imagine just a capital A. This R represents emptiness or openness. That is to say, the nature of all the Buddhas and our own real nature. So when we see this, about an arm and a half length in front of us in the space, we try to develop the sense that this embodies, not, not as a symbol of something somewhere else, but is the direct presence here in the room with you, the direct presence of all the teachers of the lineage, right back to uh, Samantha Bhadra, uh, Fajra Sattva, Garab Dorji, Padma Sambhava, and so on. And it also it embodies the presence of all the moments of beneficial connection you've had in your life, maybe with parents, school teachers, the presence of all those who have brought some sense of light and awakening into your life. So we hold this sense as a kind of fixation, we fix our attention on it in the space. Then we recite the R three times and integrate our heart with this presence of all the teachers. We say the R three times, then we relax, and then gradually this uh, ball just fades into the space and we relax into the open space and remain there. Then whatever thoughts, feelings, sensations arise, whatever sounds come from outside, colors, movements in the room occur, without working out what is there, without thinking about what's going on, just relax and be present as life unfolds, the dynamic, ever-changing display of the ground energy of the Dharmakaya. Okay. Gradually, the experience in that practice can become clearer. But at the end of the practice, we are in the same place we're doing the practice. The practice is in this system is not something apart from life. We don't go into a retreat away from the world to do a meditation and create some kind of sacred space which is separate from our daily existence. Rather, by relaxing into the situation, we experience that these three dimensions are operating at the same time. The relaxed, unchanging spaciousness, the richness of the full field of arising, and the specificity of our connection moment by moment. In which, as we look in one day, or in one way, 
a specific field opens, then we look in another way and something different happens. And that's going on all the time. But it's happening inside the unbroken continuity of the co-emergence of everything at the same time. But of course, when we relax just into our ordinary self and we forget the wider picture, then I'm the one making sense of it. I'm chopping everything up and fitting it around and getting the patterns I like or don't like. So, from the point of view of Sokshen, that's the difference between samsara and nirvana. Samsara is where there is a forgetfulness of the ground of our existence, and through that, an overemphasis on the centrality of my individual role as the one who is making things happen. And release from that is to see life is already occurring. We are part of life. It's not all up to us. We can do a few things. Omnipotence is the, the curse of samsara. People feel all-powerful. They feel able to do anything. The American dream. This is not the dream of Sokshin. The dream of Sokshin is everything's a dream, whether you're powerful or powerless. It's the same matrix which is running all the time. And by not over-inflating your sense of yourself, by staying in your own skin in the situation, you can find yourself responding effectively precisely with what is there. Not more, not less. No need for excess or deficit, just enough. And if you have just enough, the moment concludes itself. You have a completed gestalt. There's no trace, no resonance, nothing kind of disturbing. That's that, that's that, that's that. Here I am. Here I am. So, each moment is fresh, and there you are, and there you are, and there you are. And you feel light, and quite pleasant. So, on an outer level, when we say, may all beings be happy, may they be free of suffering, may they have the happiness free of suffering, we're making an aspiration for some time in the future. We would like this to occur. And with that, we can have an intention, which is an intention to develop the qualities necessary to bring that about. That would be a general Mahayana view involving developing the paramitas, uh, developing wisdom and compassion in particular, an understanding of emptiness, and with that, a commitment to save all sentient beings. All of which is good, but all of which is largely conceptual. That is to say, you create a, a pattern of thinking which gives you more confidence, more clarity, but because it's thoughts and thoughts are impermanent, it's very clear one day and then it's vanished the next. And then you feel sad, oh my God, I have to pra practice harder. How can I have this all the time? Well, the simple answer to that is you can't. You can't be a good Buddhist if you think being a Buddhist is to have holy Buddhist thoughts all the time. If you imagine you can have holy thoughts all the time, this is not to know anything about your mind. If you look at your mind, it's changing all the time. How could you possibly have fixed good thoughts? I love you all. I love you all. I love you all. Uh oh, the battery's running down. <laughs> I love you all. I love you all. Uh -huh. You can get, find India as a wash with gurus like that. They sit on the oh, blessing, blessing. You can hug Mama, Ama, all of these people. It's lovely. And then it's gone. She's gone back to India with a lot of dosh. And you're left. I love Ama. Where is she, the one you love? In India. Oh, are you happy? I'm happy when I think of Amma. I'm not happy doing anything else. And is this useful in your life? Oh, yes. Without Amma, who would I be? Ah, come on. <laughs> this is nuts. This is crazy. This is to give your power to someone else, to project your own awakening into somebody who walks off into the distance 
with the dosh. <laughs> Keep the dosh in your pocket, put your bum on the meditation seat, and it's all there. So the cent central thing is you have to observe how you cheat yourself. What are your own preoccupations? Your preoccupations won't be exactly the same as anyone else's. This is why in Buddhism they talk of the five poisons. Stupidity, or the immersion in assumptions, aversion, attachment, desire, jealousy, pride. These are very big titles. These are big boxes. You can put all of your life into these boxes. That's useful. But for us, if we want to do the practice, we have to think, how do I do it? What is the particular way in which I, as this unique, specific manifestation, get tied in knots? How do I cheat myself? How do I cheat other people? And right at first thing this morning, we were looking at the importance of not blaming ourselves, just being curious. How does it come about that although I want to do good things, I find myself doing bad? The old saying is, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So clearly good intentions aren't enough. One needs a more precise technical investigation. What is my blindness? How do I blind myself? How do I do it? Nobody can tell you. If somebody's been doing meditation a lot and they've read lots of down books, they can give you lots and lots of ideas, but it won't be exactly your version. Only you living in your skin, sitting on your meditation mat, can observe your particular ways of getting tied in knots. That's why it's a bit lonely. It would be so much nicer if somebody could just map it out and show us. But we have to engage in this with all the resources we, that we have. One of our resources is called torpor. One of our resources is called mental dullness. One of our resources is called laziness. One of our resources is called, I'd rather be doing something else. These are the friends that we bring to the meditation cushion. They come and they talk to us and they say, why are you doing this? You can't do this. You don't know how to do this. You're fooling yourself. Why don't you have a cup of tea? <laughs> These good friends of ours need to be related to. Because this is our lived existence. We won't be able to meditate starting somewhere else. We don't have any access to somewhere else. All we've got is us. That's all we have. So, getting to know yourself without blaming yourself, seeing how you can be lazy, how you can be excited, how you can be quick on the draw, how you can be impulsive, and then working out how to relate to that. If, you're very, if you find that you're very energetic and you're buzzing when you sit to do meditation, well, you can do some exercise first, put on some music, have a bop, then have a shower, and then do the practice. If you find yourself being very kind of uh, sort of sad and a bit depressed and not very hopeful, then you need to think, how can I shift this state? This is a temporary state. If you believe my state is authentic, it is the truth of my existence, I don't want to change it. Then you need to develop the mental acuity, the sharpness, to be present in dullness. For beginners this is, I think, almost impossible. Because the power of moods, moods are different from feelings. A sudden feeling comes, you're pissed off with something, and then it's gone. But moods are pervasive. They're like the morning mist. And if you're in a mood, which is a sort of pseudo-infinity, because you can't get any shape to it, it's very difficult inside that to find a point of clarity that's not quite in it, just on the edge. Very hard. So, 
if you are in that kind of mood, much better to use something external to displace it. So if you have devotion and you do that kind of path, you could do some prostrations, or you could do some prayers, or you could go out for a walk and breathe in fresh air. If you walk in the park, you can imagine all the trees, all the flowers, all the grass. I've got shining points on the end of them, sending out rainbows. The five colors of the rainbow are the antidotes to these five poisons. And the five wisdoms flow into you. The five elements come in through your eyes, through your ears, through the soles of your feet. And you just consciously replenish yourself as part of the world. And then from that you sit and do the practice. But the main uh, issue is don't be afraid of your limitations, but don't be conditioned by them either. It's just stuff. Just stuff. Since you were born, how much stuff has flown through you? Just endless hopes, fears, this, that. When you were a little kid, thinking Christmas is coming, what am I going to get? Then you're a teenager, you're falling in love. Where's it all gone? What was that all about? It's just stuff. And here we are now, at our current age, and it's more stuff. If you recognize the nature of that stuff by relaxing and seeing where it comes from, it's the energy of the Dharmakaya. That means you can experience it fresh and radiant even when the surface tone, the semantic content, is dire, is deadly, is horrid. You see, oh, it's an effulgence. It's an effulgence, something radiating out. That's the central thing. Not to enter into judgment, not to step back from experience, but also not to fall into experience. This is the central Buddha's middle way. The middle way between the extremes. This point which is not a point, which is an infinity where a thought arises and you're with it. Now, we have a body which is tilted to the front. Sense organs are looking out. And we have a long history of being this body. This is defining who we are. So we tend to think, I'm in here looking out. When we talk of this state of awareness, we're not referring to some mental functioning inside our body, some mental brain chemistry movement. Rather, the mind is a radiant self-existing awareness within which the body reveals itself. The body is in the mind. The mind is not in the body. I mean, the body is pervaded by awareness. It's not apart from awareness. But awareness is not something in this little bone dome on the top of our body. So, when we relax into this awareness, there is no limit. Everything, the back, the sides, the front, it's all coming at once. Always coming at once. And inside that, because there is no limit to it, there is nowhere else for anything to come from. So when we go out of this building and we start to walk down the street, where is the street coming from? Now, in many ways that sounds like a stupid question. The street isn't coming from anywhere. We are coming. But the street is coming into our experience. If you objectivize it, you say, well, I'm just this small flesh and blood little thing walking down a big street, and these streets have been here for hundreds of years. This is Macclesfield. But if you stay in your experience, just present, the world is revealing itself to you. You turn a corner, and suddenly a whole new world is there, instantly arising. This world is not shared by anyone else. If you ask someone, excuse me, what street are we in? He says, look, can you not read? This is whatever it is. Uh, Paradise Row. Right. We're in Paradise Row. But is that person in the same Paradise Row as you? How could you know? You'll never know. 
This is the existential aloneness. You look through your eyes at your world. Nobody else looks through your eyes. In that moment of looking, ha, huh, this is it. This is the unique freshness of my lived existence. I can step out of that to all sorts of concepts of the history of Macclesfield and who lives there and what that is and this and that and move all these signifiers around to create endless maps and patterns of meaning which I can share with other people through speaking. But that's not the same as being present. Being present is just and then inside that presence, you can talk, you can share, but the sharing is part of being present in the richness which is always dynamic and revealing itself. It's not an alternative. It's already niched, it's already embedded in the ungraspable richness of the aesthetic revelation which occurs moment by moment in the mirror-like mind. And this is the function of the practice. So even if you walk down the same street every day, wow, it's pretty nice each time. Because it's never the same street. Only on the level of convention is it the same street because it has the same name. Your experience is fresh. And when you experience each moment of life as fresh, as new, there is such a satisfaction in that. It's like having fresh fruit to eat. Delicious. Delicious. Even if on one level it's not a pleasant experience. Because pleasant and unpleasant are judgments which are added after the fact. What there is is just this. Oh. What happened? Then you go into the story about it. Oh. And our task, because we're so wrapped up in stories, is to come back to the immediacy of the moment. So if we do a little bit more practice now, and then we end for the day, and we'll do some more uh, reflection and practice tomorrow. So again we do this three hour practice and if you find yourself getting lost in it or just seeming to be in the maze of your habitual thoughts, relax again in, and again into a long out breath, just deeply breathing out and come back into this spaciousness. Ah. Oh, as much as is possible, try to stay with the quality of this practice in the evening and in the morning when you wake up. You don't need to do it in any uh, overt way. Again, just relaxing into the out-breath, opening into the space, and then being with whatever is occurring. And we start in the morning at 10 o'clock. And uh, for those who don't come to the dinner this evening, have a very good evening. See you then.
Okay, if we start with a little quiet sitting, just establishing a simple focus for your mind, for your attention on the breath or an external object, and remaining with that. Okay. <coughs> so we continue with the last verse of the text. where it says, uh, may all sentient beings abide in the equanimity, <coughs> free of both desire for friends and relatives and hatred towards enemies and strangers. In the first uh, line of, of that particular bit, the word meaning in the uh, printing has slipped a bit, so don't pay attention to the, the meaning under the pronunciation, it's not correct. So, the general idea, as we were looking yesterday, is that our basic nature or the basic quality of our aliveness or our being is not a thought. It's also not accessible through thought, and yet it is ceaselessly ornamented by thoughts. Thoughts are not the problem. The problem is our misuse of thoughts, that we try to create something enduring out of thoughts, but thoughts are always transient. That's really the central point to be aware of, so that whenever thoughts arise in your mind, defining who you are, saying something about you, just relax, let them come and go, and be with the one who remains when the thought is gone. You are still there. Most of the time we construct our sense of our own identity out of the thoughts. But after the thought goes, we are still here. So what is that basic being? What is that basic sense of presence, of aliveness? The clarity of the mind, awareness, you can call it many different things, but you, you know it for yourself. Somehow you're there. And then you're there as this or that. But it's that first sense of a pure awareness, or simply being, just not being anything in particular. That's the experience that we seek to achieve. And this verse is describing that in another way. Equanimity or impartiality means not going to either side, not going for things, not going against things, being kind of neutral. Neutral means that you don't have to have a position about a lot of things that happen. We don't have to enter into judgment to try to come to some kind of conclusion, because every situation is evolving and changing. By the time you've decided what one thing is, it's already showing a different aspect. We can never sum people up because they show different aspects. People have some good qualities which show, show some of the time and they show usually some of the time towards specific people. We also have bad qualities which show some of the time towards other people. So nobody gets the whole of us and we also don't get the whole of us because when we're doing one thing we forget all the other things we've done and then we do something else and we forget that. So we have a, a serial forgetfulness. But the key point is that each of these positions or moments that we take up is transient. And our desire to secure the territory by a definition 
leads us into a, a solidification, a consolidation of something which is not solid. Then we want to know what's what. We want to know where we are. We ask people, yeah, but what's your view on this? As if somehow somebody could spit out something enduringly defined. The best we can do is say something which is situationally defined. We can say, at the moment, this is what I feel about this situation. That's honest. But when we say, this situation is terrible, that's it to express a feeling which is arising in connection with circumstances as if it were an unchanging absolute truth of the situation. And then after a while, we see something else or something shifts inside our mood and we get a different view. So, one of the things we need to be aware of is this tendency to concretize, to make the intangible something definite. The traditional saying is, a week is a long time in politics, and a week is a long time in all our lives, and an hour is quite a long time too, because the sensations in our body are always changing, our emotions change quite rapidly, our thoughts are coming and going. What is the stable basis for our judgment? Not much. This doesn't mean that we can't have any opinion at all. Rather, we need to understand an opinion is an opinion. It's a gesture into the flow of meaning making. It's something that we add into the flux of developing perspectives on a situation. It can't be an overall truth. Because our world is ungraspable. Who can sum up who anybody is? When we read about very good people, we find out that they have a bit of a shadow and they've been up to something. When we read about very bad people, we find out that people loved them and people respected them. We think, how could that be the case? But it's a fact. Nobody is either wholly good or wholly bad. Now, in this room, we, most people are sitting in the middle. In the middle, you have to support your own body. If you're sitting at the side with the wall, you can lean against the wall. The wall gives you a sense of something definite. This is the temptation or the seduction of the extremes. If we say something is totally crap, it's like banging into a wall. You know where you are. It's, this is rubbish. Hmm. If it's rubbish, you don't need to do anything. It's, it sort of supports you. If you say, this is fantastic, can't get enough of it, really great. That's like another wall. So just there. But the middle areas, where we have ambivalence, where there's a sense of paradox, and complexities of being in the world with others, that's more like sitting in the middle of the room. It's unstable. We sit erect for a while, and then gradually our back slumps, and we bring our back back again, because it's difficult to hold an opinion for long in the middle of the force field of events. When events and circumstances are acting on us, when we are participating in the world, we're going to get moved around. So, avoiding the extremes is a central idea in Buddhism, not to take up a fixed position but rather to rest in an open state of responsiveness, responding to the situation as it emerges. But as it emerges means, it's, as it emerges, it's going to show different aspects. And so how one responds is going to evolve and develop through time. Because different aspects of a situation manifesting will hook different parts of ourselves, different emotions, different memories, different hopes and fears. And so the, the, the structure or the take that we have around that particular moment will be dependent on the interaction of many factors. 
internal psychological factors, historical things evoked by memory and so on. That is to say, we work in the world through participation in it. We don't, we're not sitting on top of a mountain looking at the world with some kind of rational overview. Rationality is very, very overprivileged in our culture. And we imagine that somehow you can step back and see clearly what is going on. Now we see in primary education, the government's changing its policy. For the last 10 years, they've tried to impose a great deal of standardization on teaching, and it hasn't been very effective. Because who is in the room? The children and the teacher. And that is an energetic field. And if the teacher is not free to trust themselves, to develop themselves, to have a confidence to be present and to respond to how the children are, how could that go well? But when half their brain is thinking about Ofsted inspectors are coming, what are the national guidelines, how can I implement the proper policy, and trying to be like a sheepdog getting these sheep-like children into the pen, it becomes highly problematic. We know this. We know this is how things actually are. It's a beautiful fantasy that if only the big brains in the world got together and sorted everything out, we could just march happily along. But we are not lemmings, although sometimes our death wish leads us in that direction. You know, actually, we are alive, responsive, impacted by the world which means if we stay in our body, we will have, through our senses, a lot of information coming about the evolving field, and we need to respond into it. So what gets in the way of feeling things in your belly, feeling them in your heart, having the sensation in your throat about speaking or not speaking, being able to have a quick, intuitive response, clearly fear, fear of other people's judgments, fear of getting it wrong, but also fixed positions, as we were looking yesterday. Having an idea that there is a right way or a wrong way to do things. Increasingly, the state would like to control all the aspects of our existence. Now, people who educate their children at home are going to be uh, open to regular government inspectors coming around and so on. There is very little left of what is private life. That is to say, we can no longer trust people. That's quite something. That paranoia and suspicion increases, and in order to survive a paranoid government, what can the citizen do? Well, try to be a good person. And the more surveillance there is, the more you try to be good, which makes the government more and more addicted to control. This is a, not a very nice situation. We have plenty of examples, even in European history in the last 150 years, of situations like this. The outcome is usually not good. But it's quite difficult for people to find their voice and say, piss off, leave me alone, you don't know who I am. I exist. I am a person. I'm not a number. I'm not a thing. And you don't know who I am. Your database about me is not me. Information about people is not being a person. It's not knowing a person. To know a person, you sit with them, you look at them, and you get the felt sense of them. That's what people are. They are these amazing, ungraspable, intangible, but always revealing phenomena. That, of course, requires time, it requires respect, it requires an openness, it requires love in the heart. Much easier to have a database and control people. This is a real big problem from the point of view of Buddhism. Equanimity is to balance oneself always on the central fulcrum point of for and against. The waves of enthusiasm and joy and going out and enjoying, participating, and withdrawal, suspicion, and dread 
these pulsations are happening all the time in the traditional grouping of the five skandhas or the five aspects of composition of a person. The, the second of these is the sort of feeling tone, which is positive, negative, or neutral. And a great deal of the time, we swing between the positive and the negative. I like, I don't like. What we're looking at here is how to remain on that central neutral point, where by remaining balanced, you can feel the pool for and against. It's not that you become sort of rigid and frozen. You can feel this pool, but you stay centered and grounded in yourself and use that information <clears throat> as a way of formulating your response into the environment. A bit like in the therapy situation where the therapist experiences a transference from the patient. That is to say, they feel something operating inside themselves as uh, positive or negative, as affirming or disconfirming of their own sense of self. And that leads them then to have some information about how to respond to the person. The person is showing me something about how they are in their embodied being, not by telling me about it, but by what impacts the energy field between us. If we're sensitive to that, we can then respond into the situation. So equanimity is not on the basis of simply homogenizing all beings. Sometimes in Buddhist texts, it kind of recommends this as a, as a process. For example, we say in the general Mahayana teachings, we say we should reflect that all beings have been our mother in a past life. And when they were our mother, they did many good things to take care of us. Because of that, we have a, a debt of gratitude to all beings. So that before you meet anyone, you are already in their debt. So when we go towards someone, it should be with gratitude to all they have already given us. So that even if they're in an angry mood or a bad mood, that's just a transient surface phenomenon. The real basis is the fact that they have fed us and clothed us and taken care of us. That's homogenization. You take all the differences of sentient beings and put them in a big pot and stir them around and then label the bottle mum. <laughs> Drink a pint of mum a day. <laughs> no, but that's helpful. It's helpful because it illuminates something, but of course it's not the whole truth. All of these methods that we have in Buddhism are not truth. They, they don't establish how things are. They establish possibilities of how you can behave. That is to say, they're inviting you to move your perspective and through that to move your behavior and observe what happens to you. We don't just do these practices as a kind of <coughs> Protestant work ethic. We're not driven to them in order to somehow become better people. Rather, we do them as ways of uh, a kind of research into what is evoked in you when you do that practice. Almost like stirring the bottom of the pond to see what rises to the surface. So if you think all beings have been my mother and I have a debt of gratitude to them, therefore it behoves me, it's my responsibility to move towards them with compassion and gratitude, you can then see what that feels like. You might think, shit, well, I didn't like my mum. She was a bit of a bitch. Lots of people feel like nowadays. In which case, you, you then have something to look at. You're then thinking, well, how do I conceptualize my own mother? What is the basis of kindness? Then you can start to look at your own neurotic formation. I don't like my mum because she was like this and this and this. So. Did she give you any food ever? Yes. Did she give you a place to sleep? Yes. Was she ever helpful? Yes. But anyway, she was a bitch. Okay. So let's put that on the scales. What's on the pan of things she did? And what's on the pan of things that she really pissed you off with? And you have to really look at that. Oh. And so she pissed you off because she was always on your case and she wouldn't let you go out when you wanted to 
and she never seemed to agree with your decisions. Well, what were you doing at that time in your life? <coughs> well, I was sniffing quite a lot of glue. And <laughs> so you wanted someone always on your side. In that way, <coughs> we, we use the practice to try to examine what are these knots and turns inside ourselves. It's, it's not that all beings can believe or not believe it. I can say it's not that we have to have a sense that all beings have been our mother as some kind of solid fact. But these are practices, that is to say, they're intentional uh, gestures of attention and intention that we take up, like running a searchlight across a particular trajectory. It illuminates some things and not others. If you walk on a dark night in a wood with a torch, the torch shows you some things, but not others. So that's how we need to use the practices, to illuminate something about the world and about ourselves. Because the central question is always, who am I and what am I up to? What am I up to? How am I constituting myself in this moment? What am I bringing together as the, this, the, the situation of my being as I move towards the world. So if I'm constituting myself out of resentment, out of anger, irritation, a feeling of being hard done by, a feeling of entitlement, all of these things will bring a selective attention to what seems meaningful in the, in the experiential field and what's not meaningful. It's not about blaming ourselves. It's just from a very neutral point of view, seeing, oh, these are the factors that arise inside me. And on the basis of that, this is what is revealed from the world. This is really dependent or interdependent arising, dependent co-origination. It means outer and inner factors arise simultaneously and develop this particular encapsulated moment, this bubble in time which seems completely true. And then it's gone. But while these factors operate together, this is the take we have. This is what we get. So the more we can see the dynamic operation of our own existence, the more we can see, oh, these factors that constitute themselves through me are movements which I am appropriating or identifying with and therefore in this moment it is as if they are me. This is what I am at the moment. But then the next moment I'm not like that. So how come it seemed so intensely just me when that had locked on? That's something to look at again and again and that's why when you have this uh, basic kind of meditation that we began with we start to have an experience of focused attention which lets the thoughts go by once your awareness or your capacity for mindfulness is separated from the intoxication with the thoughts, the identification with the thought, you start to see thoughts for what they are they are the raw resources out of which you construct yourself moment by moment. Some of them are very useful and some aren't. If you go into a big supermarket, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of things you can buy to eat. Lots of them you wouldn't want to eat. They have nothing to do with your existence. Other people will eat these things. In the same way, once you start to be clear about how you want to live, who you want to be, you can see that already in the pantry of your soul, you've got lots of out-of-date cans. Hmm? You've got lots of ingredients that aren't much cop, but somehow they're there. And if you just cook with whatever's around without any awareness, you'll keep cooking up your neurosis, your limitations, your agitations, and so on. So part of what we want to develop is a discriminating attention. 
traditionally this is called wisdom or prajna or shera. It means to discriminate between the qualities of external phenomena and internal phenomena so that one can see what is useful in the moment. And again, there is nothing which is truly bad. Intense anger can be very helpful in some situations. If you're walking home on a dark night and someone comes to attack you, being able to mobilize an intense, aggressive anger, shouting, swearing, that is likely to scare the person off, is very, very helpful. If you're in India and a, a stray dog is coming and wanting to bite you, if you can't mobilize some a aversion towards them, if they bite you and you get rabies, that's not good news. So there are some situations where anger is extremely important. All the five poisons have some value. But my teacher, C. Alama, when he was young, he trained with one of his uncles in medicine. And they used to go out collecting herbs and stones and so on to prepare the medicines. And one day he sent all the, the young students out to collect all the things that they couldn't use for medicine. And when Sialama came back, he said he couldn't find anything. And his, his uncle said, well, that's the basis of being a good doctor. There is nothing in this world which cannot be a medicine. No kind of stone or earth or tree flower, everything can be useful because we exist as complex systems, aspects of which can be antidoted or reinforced by the various patterns of the five elements. In the same way, when we think about the five poisons, we need to become skillful in knowing how to use them. A traditional example for this is the peacock, which in India they say the peacock very much likes the aconite plant, and aconite is quite a powerful poison. But because the peacock eats the aconite, the colors in its tail feathers shine more brightly. So how do we become able to deal with these poisons and become more shining from them? Clearly not by a sort of uh, blind self-indulgence but with a sense of, I exist always in the world with others. Even if you're doing a solitary retreat, you're surrounded by invisible beings, and the world is just outside your door anyway. Being in the world, being part of the world, everything I do has an impact on other people. If you live on your own and you're sitting in your flat, how you walk, how you make a cup of tea, when you go to sleep, all of this impacts the world. On that level, we don't have a truly private space on an energetic level. Because what, how we treat ourselves today will be part of how we come out into the world the next morning. Therefore, in order to be available for the world, we have to understand how we are constituted, but also how other people are constituted. When I work in the hospital, I see uh, people who have behaviors that I don't particularly like. It's not very helpful if I just tell them that they're terrible people. Lots of people have for sure told them that before, and it hasn't changed anything. They probably feel that on one level, but they're also uh, caught up in a sort of defensive fuck you, so they're not going to pay attention if somebody's on their case. So how to be with somebody who is angry, aggressive, intimidating, without any respect, greedy and demanding, in a way that will help them move out of that position. Clearly the first thing we have to know is these are dynamic qualities. These are ways in which their energy is emerging. Where is that energy coming from? If we say 
the reason that they are like that is because they are bad people, because that's what bad people are. Bad people behave in these ways, they are behaving in these ways, therefore, clear conclusion, they are bad people. That doesn't take us very far, that's just solipsistic, it runs around chasing its own tail. The five poisons arise out of ignorance. Ignorance is not a volitional activity. We don't choose to be ignorant. We find ourselves lost. When we get lost, we get anxious. When we get anxious, we become afraid. When we become afraid, we collapse or become defensive. When we become defensive, we become angry and aggressive. It's not rocket science. It's fairly straightforward, that series. So when somebody is being upfront aggressive, they're lost. You see that if you work with teenagers. How to stay present with the open dimension, which is the very thing that they have lost. Because if you come into a fixed position in relation to their fixed position, you just quack into each other. <coughs> Nothing much changes. Your battles for power and so on won't resolve anything. So how to remain relaxed and open? It means we have to know about our own fear. And that's why the Bodhisattva path is traversed partly by a compassionate connection with other people, not turning away from them, but also partly, and in fact the first part, is to know yourself. Wisdom and compassion, they say, uh, move together like the two wings of a bird. But wisdom has to come first. That is to say, you have to know that you're full of shit. You have to know the knots you get tied in. Not by blaming yourself, but just by seeing, oh, this is what a knot is, and this is how it's tied. And the more you see that in a precise, neutral way, and you see the negative consequences it has when they're not untied, you start to get a real deep confidence. This is how the world works. This is what other people are. They're all knotted up. That's why they behave in these ways. When you walk down the street and you see people walking towards you, you start to look at their posture. You see if their shoulders are held up. You can see if they're doing this upper chest breathing. You can see how their feet are whacking onto the ground. People show how relaxed or not relaxed they are through their embodiment, through the way their voice is, through the kind of eye contact they can give or not give. So when we start to know that about ourselves, then we start to see, oh, the whole world is this tightening and loosening, tightening and loosening, except people get out of the rhythm. They get into their own limited rhythms where they don't fully release. In the yoga system, this is described as <coughs> the channels in the body becoming knotted or blocked so that the, the prana or the energy can't move fully through the body. In particular, the, the around the size of the central channel, we have these two main channels. One's said to be solar or lunar, male or female. And when they get blocked and don't go into the central channel, then you have the energetic buzzing, because the sun and the moon are both active. They create uh, energy, they're a bit like yin and yang, they're movements of energy. The central channel is completely relaxed, open and empty. So the path of yoga is to bring all the small channels into communication with the two main side channels, and then the side channels into the central channel so that all energy flows into emptiness and then comes back out of emptiness. So that moment by moment, we're freshly moving into the environment. So this is the real basis here, what it means by equanimity. Equanimity is not holding oneself in a level position. It's not like being a judge in a court of law, trying to be unswayed by the arguments, but give a balanced review to all the evidence. Rather, by relaxing, by integrating into the unborn ground, which is 
without bias. It doesn't go in any direction. It's neutral. The state of awareness is not improved by our good deeds and it's not destroyed by our bad deeds. You don't get rewarded for being a good person. That's very important to see. You get a relative reward, that's to say you get some good karma and you exchange that in the supermarket of existence for a couple of bars of chocolate and you get a nice life for a while. But sooner or later you get cancer or you'll die or you'll get Alzheimer's and you burn up your karma. You're going to get some more karma. Next life you're born as a cow and it's pretty difficult for cows to get karma. So, the real nature is not created or destroyed. Hmm, that's pretty nice. So, what is all our busyness for? That's a good question. What are we running around being busy for? What are we trying to do? A lot of the time, our life is organized by particular storylines which relate to some aspects of previous lives, but a lot to aspects of this life. For example, I may have said before, one of the things that's very obvious to me is that I work in a hospital in order to be close to my father. My father died 40 years ago, but my father worked in a bank and before that he worked in the army. So he worked in institutions and I work in an institution. That's why I work in an institution. I'd make more money if I was in private practice. Working in a hospital is not even a particularly uh, efficient or useful way of helping people. But I go in there and somehow it's like being with my dad. You could say that's neurotic. But what I've, I've discovered in myself is that the, the reasons why I do so many things are just these storylines that run through my existence. The key thing is how would you live if you removed all these storylines? It would be very difficult. We are all enacting little bits of script, usually not a whole play, but little bits of script from various plays that we were established in at certain times in our childhood. It's not wrong to do that, but it's very important to see, oh, there are many causes for the pattern of our lives which are not our overt statement, I want to help people, or I want to do this, or I want to do that. That's froth on the coffee. The main thing is these old storylines. Then we start to understand what karma is. That actions have immediate effects, but they also have long-term consequences. They set up patterns of selection which somehow make sense to us. It somehow feels right. So the new situation is there because it's resonating with something from the past. So, how could I not be caught up in these things? To be in the world is to be caught up in these things. If you come into this world, you will take on patterns. The whole idea of the development of notions of the pure Buddha lands and then um, bodhisattvas or Buddha forms manifesting into the world from these pure lands is the idea that you can be in the world but not of it. That's a very nice idea, but actually all the lamas I've met were pretty much in the world. You do become of it you do become of it, because as soon as you come out of your mother's belly, you're into a matrix of culture and language, and you can have some perspective, some insight on that. But as soon as you start to speak, what you reveal are your particular traits. Who has a neutral voice in the world? Nobody. Nobody I have met anyway. People speak with either a kind of clarity of their existence or not. When people speak with that impassioned clarity, say like Martin Luther King, people are very touched and moved. 
he was inhabiting so much history, so much experience of himself and people he identified with. That's what everyone does. If you listen to the Dalai Lama speaking, he embodies his traditional monastic training, his power and status as an important world figure, but also all the pain and suffering of the Tibetan people. That flows through him. That is to say, if you are in the world, the world will flow through you. So, equanimity, again, doesn't mean to be apart, to be unengaged. What it means is to recognize what comes through. And that sometimes we will move in this direction, and sometimes we'll move in that direction. I mean, if you wanted to be completely non-judgmental, completely without bias, you wouldn't be able to do anything. You would be so uh, paralyzed because every moment by moment we're being pulled or we're being pulled. So it's very important to see that equanimity is the recognizing of the movements of energy from the position which doesn't change. That is to say, awareness doesn't change, but energy is always changing. To be in the world is to be touched. To be touched is to be moved. To be moved is you move in relation to that situation. That is to say, you have a precise, specific response, and that response will be turned into the situation. You will niche how you manifest into that particular context. If you have parents, when you visit them, you speak in a different way from how you would speak to strangers. How your body is with them, the freedom to say things or not say them, is created together out of the family system, which is a, another way of describing a dependent co-origination. So, when the text is saying, an equanimity which is free of a desire to help our friends, the people who we like, or, and also free of an aversion or hatred towards enemies and strangers. What it's talking about is fixed positions, not specific responses. Because if you took the logic to that, you would be, you'd cook your Sunday lunch and you'd go in outside and feed other people. And some traditions, they tend to do that. In the Jewish faith, on the Shabbat evening, it's a custom to invite a stranger in who wouldn't have hospitality and feed them. That's a very lovely custom. But generally speaking, you know, you don't pop into the neighbors to help their kid with the homework. You help your own kid with the homework. Because if you enter into a system, it has a logic of its own. That is a series of activities. Where it would become a position is if you're always thinking how your child can do better than other children. And if when you talk to the neighbor and you find that their child's got a higher number of GCSEs, you think that's terrible and my child should be better and I don't see any value in their child. That's getting locked into this is where I stand, this is what I'm committed to rather than the sense of how one can open and respond. Every response will have a bias. I don't know if you can think of anything that doesn't have a bias. You go to buy milk. You've got skimmed, semi-skimmed, and full cream milk. What are you going to buy? One of, them. One of the three. I'll take them all. <laughs> you, know, you have to choose. choose. Choosing means yes to this and no to that. That's already a bias. But it is an act, it is an event, it's not necessarily a position. If you support yourself <coughs> by establishing a formal position where you think these people are terrible, we shouldn't have these people, I don't like these people, trade unions should be banned, or BNP should be banned, whatever it is, it's very strong opinion, that's where the problem arises. Because then you create an ossification, a hardening, a freezing of your flexibility of response. And you know before the situation arises what it's going to be. 
<coughs> you know, we we live in a world now where relationships are increasingly important because they appear to be more and more fragile. People seek commitment in a relationship and sometimes that comes in the form of uh, setting out particular behaviors but actually the only real commitment probably which has any value is the commitment to keep relating and the problem with relationship whether it's a therapeutic relationship or a romantic relationship is that because it's a ship, you get on the ship and you sail wherever it goes, it becomes a thing, a container. Now I've got a relationship. So I feel safe. Oh, I don't have a relationship. I don't feel safe. What will people think about me because I haven't managed to have a relationship? I will be less than. But a relationship is a formal, abstract category. What is actually required is relating being relaxed, open, available and willing to respond. Whether the formality, the formalizing of a relationship improves that or doesn't improve it, that's a sociological question. But from a Dharma point of view, because of impermanence and because of the freshness of awareness, moment by moment, we have to be there. We have to think, how are you? How are you? So when we're talking with people, we look at their face, we see their eyes, we see the register of their breath, and we can read from their face whether they're distracted or engaged. And if they're not engaged, we can then decide just to keep blethering on, enjoying ourselves. <laughs> or we can think, oh, maybe I should do something different. Because my desire to get across my point of view, and the other person's desire or capacity to stay in touch with me while I enjoy myself are not necessarily going to be arising at the same time. They may have got bored or got cut off. So, to be relating to others means others are entitled to determine how I am. So, Externally, we have this formal practice of tonglen, of giving and receiving, in which we say, I give all my happiness and the roots of my happiness to other beings, and I take into myself all the suffering of others. It's a kind of exchanging one thing for another. Another way of saying it is, whenever I am happy, I will give all my happiness to others. Whenever I am sad, I will take all the sadness of others unto me. And that's useful as a practice. But a more subtle way of the same practice is being fully in contact in whatever situation you're in, being, as it were, naked on the contact boundary, observing whatever agendas you've built up in your mind, and seeing how these agendas come from pre-existing positions so you're actually importing or projecting or transferring predetermined notions of what you want, what you would like, into the situation. You're overloading the actual situation. And just dropping that, being present, and seeing what happens. If you do that, you're optimally open the other person can impact you on all sorts of areas of your being. And then you respond to that. And you respond to that into a field which is changing as you respond. So, as the person speaks, the quality of your listening shifts their experience of speaking. Because if you're speaking to somebody who clearly isn't hellish interested, it's not much fun. And vice versa. If you're speaking to them, they will feel addressed. And if they feel addressed, that allows them to be validated and then respond. There's a Russian theorist called Bakhtin, <coughs> who was very interested in uh, communication and language. Mainly he was analyzing novels developed this uh, theory of uh, it's called now dialogism but 
one of the significant things he, he looked at was that whenever there is a speech act, there is an addressee. That is to say, we're always speaking to someone. But very often, we're not speaking to the person in front of us. We're speaking to someone else. This is another way of thinking about what's called transference. That the person we might be talking to is our mother or father, who could have been dead years and years ago, but somehow we're still looking for their approval. And so we make our, we come into the world, how we manifest is in terms of an ongoing communication, seeking love and validation. And that's what we're doing when we're speaking to someone. So we're not actually in contact with who this person is. This is a, a very, very common form of neurosis. It's one of the most uh, common presenting things with patients that I see where actually they're looking for mother's milk. They're looking for unconditional love, total approval. But if you're 40, you're not going to get it. Missing, off the shelf, no longer produced. What you get as an adult is conditionality. That's the sad fact of life. And these pseudo-Rogerians who are selling unconditional love are pox on their houses. <laughs> because it's not unconditional, it's on the basis of dosh or because you're a student on a training course. It's conditional. Everything in life as adults is conditional. However, the conditionality can be mutual. You, know, you can have a sense, I see who you are, I see what you're looking for, and I do my best to meet that. There will be a gap, there will be an abyss between us. Because I'll never fully understand you, you'll never fully understand me. But in that, we can do some dancing in the dark. We can get some kind of proximity. That's why, given the complete existential aloneness that each of us inhabit, it's so easy to build bridges on the basis of assumption, to assume I know who you are, I know who you want. And then the frightened little bit of us can sort of submerge itself in that, and it's as if we are safe. And then after a while, we think, mm -mm, these shoes don't quite fit, this jacket's a bit tight. And then we get irritated, and then the person says, well, if you don't want my help, it falls apart again. Actually, being with other people is very difficult. What's required is, is a confidence, a confidence to be tentative. The confidence that you can be open and the tentativeness of always being in touch with the feedback loop. So you start, but maybe you have to do a s double somersault in midair and get back on your own feet. Because when you move towards the other, if you really feel how they are, they may be telling you, whoa, I've had enough. But I wanted to, and I, I feel I want to help you. And I've taken the Bodhisattva vow, so I can't stop now. <laughs> well, maybe we should stop for a cup of tea. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so, if we think a little bit about friends and enemies, Clearly, these are uh, names of categories. Uh, these are concepts. And we fit people we know into either category. But in the Buddhist teachings on impermanence, it often uh, suggests that friends become enemies and enemies become friends. And we've probably experienced that in our own lives, that people that we were once close to, they drift away. Or sometimes there's a sudden explosion and you really don't want to see each other and what seemed to be very close and affirmative <coughs> is transformed into something else. So we could see that what we take to be a friend, what we take to be an enemy is contingent. That is to say, it's dependent on the interaction of many different factors. It's not that this person has these wonderful qualities and therefore they will be our friend. But when we have that sort of feeling, and it's a strong and powerful feeling, it's always just half a sentence. 
this person has these wonderful qualities and therefore I would like them to be my friend but I recognize that these qualities are not all of them and that this situation, this moment will change and I will also not be the same person who now wants to be their friend. This could be quite disheartening. The Buddhist teaching on impermanence is really quite challenging. It's saying, as I've repeated many times in this couple of days, there is not very much that we can rely on in the ordinary world. The factors which give rise to something being the way it is now and on the basis of which we take it to be that is what it is and therefore I want it or I don't want it, these factors change. And if we have invested a lot on this particular current concatenation of circumstances, the way in which these factors meet together, they're juxtaposed, if we invest a lot in that, we are actually creating the basis for our own suffering because it won't last it seems to be very real, then for all sorts of reasons it changes and then it's gone. How could that be? I remember being absolutely shocked when I was living in India. I went uh, to a place where there were many Western people in the um, mid-70s and I saw for the first time a punk. I saw this woman with a green Mohican and wearing all kind of strange jewelry and looking incredibly aggressive. And then there was a party and she played some of this music. I thought, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I was a long-haired hippie. I couldn't believe that anybody would want to exchange the music of the 60s for this mad ranting. I just I couldn't understand it. And then as I got more experience of it, I realized that the 60s are gone. How could that be? That was my world. That was, you know, that was it. Why would anybody want to get rid of it? But clearly a whole new generation of young people came in, in a different world. It was really shocking. Something that seemed to me valid, politically interesting, and having so many things, suddenly another world takes place and you can't go back. All that I had thought would be a kind of vehicle that could carry me through my life shifted. And so when I came back to Britain, it was to a very different Britain. And then I was in Britain for a few months and I went back to India, but already it was a different India. And this is what we experience, that we have just moments and we're either fully there in the moment or we're not. If we're not in the moment, it's because we're thinking about the past or the future. And when we're thinking about the future, we're often thinking about how we can extend this moment into the future. But then this moment's gone and that future doesn't arrive. All we've got is now, which is all there is. And this now is inherently fragile, inherently doomed. It's not going to last. Which is why in Tantra, there is a huge attention to aesthetic enjoyment. When we look at these tankas, we see beautiful colors, lovely shapes, and so on. You go to, a, if you do some puja together, you have lovely chants, and so on. This is because beauty allows us to open most fully <coughs> into the moment. We, are, we, we touch through all our different chakras, all our different centers, and we really feel, I am here. There's no barrier between me and my existence. And what I'm connected with is going to change. Because an aesthetic appreciation is different from a grasping or an appropriation. We, it's an opening of the heart to being present with this, knowing that it will pass. It's the same as if you go to the opera or the theater, it begins, there's a middle, and then there's an end. It is doomed. It's not going to last forever. It's not an alternative reality 
though you can use any form of the arts in an escapist way, essentially it's the evocation of a particular constellation of factors which allows you to most fully come alive and express yourself. So if you like opera and you go to, say, La Traviata, the, the themes are so poignant that one's moved and touched and some sense of the sadness of one's own betrayals, one's own sacrifices and so on is, is shown in great strength and resonance and then it's gone. And so, you know, as Aristotle said, the function of the theatre is that the catharsis which is on stage brings a softer catharsis in the people who are watching it. And this catharsis is not like kind of emptying your bowels. It's not a, a getting rid of, but it's actually a bringing to the surface the felt sense of, oh, this is my life. This is what life is. It's these moments of jealousy or pain or suffering or madness. And then there's something else. And then there's something else. I mean, Shakespeare is fantastic at this. Because in his tragedies, there's always comic interludes. As if to say, this is true, and it's not the whole story. And it's not the whole story. And that's the same in our lives. So we're fully in one thing, and then it's gone, and then there's another thing. It's important to tell jokes at funerals. Because the dead are gone, and that's sad, and life goes on. And the fact that life goes on is not an insult to the dead, it's not a forgetfulness of them, it's the fact that everything is arising simultaneously. There is a co-emergence of the whole shebang. It's all here. The good, the bad, the ugly, the pleasant, the unpleasant. And so an aesthetic appreciation is an appreciation that values whatever tonal quality is there. Not just the primary colors, but every mule of gray, brown, and so on. So, in relation to friends and enemies, these are categories. We don't live directly in categories. Categories mediate our experience. When we meet someone, something happens in the interaction. We're either opening or closing. If there are people who we habitually find it impossible to open with, we might think that they're enemies because we experience that we have to defend ourselves against them. If there are people who we habitually find ourselves opening to, we might think these are our friends because somehow it's, there's an ease of being that's evoked in being with them. The question for people who practice the Dharma is how to be open to people we take to be enemies. That is to say, I, I examine the repertoire of resonances that I have inside myself, and I see that my resonances are not adequate to be a key to unlock the door to communication with the other person. So, when I first heard this punk music, I thought it would be impossible to dance to that music. Luckily, I was still in the period of my life where I took a lot of LSD, and <laughs> that was an alternative key, because you can dance to anything when you're out of your skull. But generally speaking, you stay inside a frame, and we can't go forward. Now, if we take the Bodhisattva vow in any way seriously, the intention to help all beings, before you can help people, you have to meet them. And you can't meet them if they're already beyond your repertoire. So the work is to constantly increase our capacity to move in different resonances. These can be very slow resonances, very hot, excited resonances, so that all the possibilities of connection are there. And that's what's displayed in these tankas. You see naked dancing women, you see angry men with flames all around them. These are uh, images for the practice of both men and women. They're showing peaceful forms, 
gorgeous forms, scary forms, excited forms. These are the ranges of qualities that we need to develop. For example, these wrathful gods are about how to be at home in the house of anger, how to acknowledge our own irritation, not to be frightened by it, and to integrate anger into emptiness, to see that when we move into a state of being angry, to directly perceive the anger is arising out of an unborn, empty state of awareness. When you start to have that experience, then the anger is not so dangerous because it's not driven by, I am angry. It's not got this contracted ego irritation that's wanting to push out, you're fucking me off, you're destroying my life, I hate you. Because the anger is not coming from me being attacked, me being in danger. It's that the other person is manifesting in the field, is part of my world, part of my experience, and my current capacity can't deal with it. That's why the ego gets angry. So if we take our practice seriously, we have to find ways of relaxing and opening and thinking, they are annoying. That's what they are. So what does it mean for me to be annoyed? I am not being allowed to be the way I want to be because this other person is insisting on them being the way they want to be. Okay, what does it mean I'm not allowed to be the way I want to be. How many ways of being do we have? Even if we're not all that <clears throat> psychologically flexible, we can move in quite a few ways. We can all be happy and sad. We can all be more generous, less generous. So we've all got a few moves we can make. So why, given that we know we're moving creatures, are we deciding that we're not going to move for this person? Why should I? I don't want to. Mm. Okay, so we're sitting on top of our little dung heap, crying away. Mm -hmm. I know what's what, don't you do that to me, I won't put up with it. And our world is getting smaller and smaller, but actually feeling to get bigger and bigger because we've got more and more indignant. So the, the antidote to this is to put the other first. What do they need? If they're trapped, and I return the compliment by being trapped myself, we're not going to get anywhere. Why shouldn't I move? Well, why should I have to? Because it helps if somebody moves. But why me? Why is it always me? Well, you said you wanted to help me. <laughs> you signed up for it. It's in the small print at the bottom. <laughs> it's actually very nice to move. Because the more you move, the more you experience yourself being flexible, and the less likely you are to take yourself seriously. My position, if we understand dependent co-origination, right, my position is determined by the movement of factors. That is to say, it is not the expression of some internal <coughs> essence. From the Buddhist point of view, there is no internal essence. We don't exist as self-defined from the inside out. I am me because I am me. Why do you do that? Well, I do it just because I'm me. That's what I always do. That doesn't take us anywhere. We do these things because we've learned to manifest a very limited range of possibilities. Now, we're lucky we meet practices that can expand the range of possibilities we have. And through that, we have more movement in ourselves, and the, the wonderful thing about movement is the more flexible and the deeper this movement is coming from, it settles down more quickly afterwards. What's called the refractory period, the period from arousal to calmness, gets quicker and quicker. The reason that so many young people end up cutting themselves and doing very destructive behaviors is that they're buzzing, that they're, uh, due to traumas in most cases, their system has adapted to a state that when they're up, they stay up for a very long time. And in order to come down at all, they've had to use very crude methods, like cutting a big gash in their arm. And there's some relief that comes from that. And very often people on the outside, they cannot understand how could there be any relief. 
but it's because it shifts the state and then the biochemical arousal goes down, the cortisol goes down, the adrenaline stops pumping. And then... So we want to be able to make these shifts in much softer ways. That's all the teachings of the Buddha, is how to shift your state to fit the world. But as long as we feel that how I am is determined by a fixed internal logic, me just being me, there's a resistance to changing. Because it locks clearly onto a win or lose position. Because if I'm changing to fit you, it's as if you've won. You're the master and I'm the servant. I'm not putting up with that anymore. I've had too much of that in my life. You can immediately feel the kind of resistance that comes as if movement was a punishment. But movement is actually to come back into the integration of the self. In the Dzogchen tradition, they describe how this natural state is open and shining like a mirror. Within the mirror, many reflections arise. These are the display of energy. And inside the total field of reflections, like our experience of this whole room here, we experience our own bodies moving, we speak, stretch, and so on. This movement, the movement of ourselves, the movement which is ourselves, we're nothing other than this ceaseless display, this is inseparable from the ground of our being. So this, at this very moment, we are the radiance of the Dharmakaya. So this radiance can move in all sorts of different ways. That is to say, because its ground or its root is empty or open, it cannot be priorly determined in a particular form. Life can take many different forms. That's amazing, isn't it? I can be many different people. That's why, you know, in this uh, tradition, the Nyingmapa tradition, as we touched on in the past, we have Padmasambhava, and he is known to have eight major manifestations and hundreds of thousands of lesser manifestations. And he shows these different forms in different situations. This is not different from ourselves. The difference that appears to be the case is that he does it with ease and we do it often feeling coerced. We're forced to change. Or we use substances. We take, drink alcohol and then we become more boisterous or more depressed. Or we go on a holiday and then we feel different. He shows these different forms for the sake of others. So, the more we see that who we really are is not a fixed thing, it's not determined by our name, or our color, or our age, or our sex, it's determined by nothing more than an open capacity, a potential for manifestation. And we come into the world, into a field of formative factors, our family, when we're small, the kind of school we went to, what the mother tongue is, and so on. And these formative factors then inter interact with more environmental factors, and we find ourselves patterned in this particular way. We meet other people and we think, how can they be like that? Well, they're like that because they're different causal factors. That's enormously important. Traveling, meeting people with different backgrounds helps us to see there is no inherent truth in my little story. I'm just one version of the universal story of people growing up, having events, becoming bent and distorted, closed in, or too boisterous as a, as a result of that. And when we see that, what a freedom there is. I don't have to be the the curator of this museum of my childhood. I don't have to keep replicating the same patterns. I can be different. Then we can think, how would you like me to be? How do you need me to be? And that can be both a response to the explicit request from another, but also 
the implicit demand present in the contortions of someone else's nature. Some people are most helped by being told to shut up. Some people are most helped by being encouraged to speak. Nobody likes to be told to shut up. But if somebody is just a loose cannon and, and, and maddening themselves and others by being over their bows and intoxicated by a stream of consciousness, that's not very helpful. So compassion takes us into responding to the actual lived circumstance of another person. Of course, there's a question then, how can I know that I'm not just acting out my own stuff, I'm not dumping on them? Well, there's a big difference between an impulsivity, which is the rerouting or the reheating uh, or representation of an old pattern, and a true spontaneity which is cooked in the moment with the other. You can always check that out for yourself. If, when you're angry, you're saying something to someone and it sounds like an old record, that's a sign that this is a neurotic structure. But if it's something, and, and you're quite surprised, my God, how come I'm saying that? You may well be speaking right into the heart of the matter. Now, this establishes something very important. When our activity is fresh, it's also nice for us. Of course, we're constantly surprised at what we're doing. It's not boring to be alive. If you're alive, you come out with something new and something new. Then you feel vital. And that vitality also is attractive to other people. So they connect with you and it gives you more chance to then help them into their vitality. Everybody, we say, has this Buddha nature. The Buddha nature is the capacity to be open, radiant, connected, at peace and compassionate, wise and compassionate. When we encounter people tied in knots, they need inspiration. They need our life to be strong and clear enough to help them. In the Zen tradition, they talk about the transmission of the lamp, that the lamp of the awareness of the teacher lights the lamp of the student that's not yet lit and as soon as that flaming wick hits the wick which is not yet lit it bursts into flames bursts into flames that's what the transmission of these teachings is about to feel more alive to be more curious about oneself to not take things for granted to not be locked in boxes so this brings us back to the question of friends and enemies these are boxes that we put people into these categories. We like this kind of person, we don't like that kind of person, and so on. <clears throat> and if we do that kind of thing, then the rigidity helps us to predict how we're going to be, but it cuts us off from the amazing vitality of the field of interaction. So this is the points again to the basic distinction between samsara and nirvana. Samsara is a domain of control even though inside it we often feel out of control. It's the domain in which we're trying to come up with strategies to stay in charge, to stay ahead of the game. In that sense, it's, it's a sort of forensic setting. You know, it's, it's a place where people feel alienated and dislocated from the world, and the only response they can have is to try and dominate and control. Which, in the tantric tradition, is seen as the basis of the demonic forms. And you often see these uh, powerful, wrathful deities and that they came into existence as the power necessary to overtake the demons of control. Because the worst aspects of our world are people feeling they know what to do. Knowledge, big plans, usually lead to disaster because in an evolving world, you have to be present moment by moment. And everybody has to be present. But the idea that you vote once every five years and delegate your authority to somebody who then never pays any attention to you and just does what they like, I mean, this is an absolute mockery of any meaning of democracy. You know, in old Athens, people met in the assembly and they confronted each other. 
not everybody could do it. Only free men could do it. Women couldn't do it. Slaves couldn't do it. Foreigners couldn't do it. But at least there was a face-to-face -face contact. And so the exit in here of equanimity is when we meet people, instead of putting this category, friend or enemy, I like, I don't like, we just stay in the face-to-face -face and relate. And when we feel we can't do that, then we need to take that back into meditation and think, what is this limitation? What is this knotting in myself that makes it impossible for me to be available to this person? So we see fear sometimes, aversion, and we have to look. And so we sit in the meditation, we relax and open, doing the three R's. And when these patterns arise, we see how seductive they are for us, how sticky that we believe in them. So we have to sit and encounter our judge, our judgmental self, because that's a very powerful position in which we know what's what. We tell the world how it is. What, what you know, confidence, what power, what courage seems to be in that. But actually, it's empty. There's no truth in these. It's just pompous inflation. So if we can sit with that and allow the thought of power, of certainty, of dominance to arise, we see it, and then it goes. It's just one of the buses. So you've got a big bus station, there's lots of buses. You get on the wrong bus, it's not going to take you anywhere useful. You have to think, what bus do I want to get on? Where am I going? If we are committed to contact with human beings, we need the bus that goes towards this person, and then this person, and this person. We need to have a lot of buses. We're just passengers. That's the thing. If you're a bus driver, you're stuck with a bus. If it's my bus, I'm not going to leave it, so I'm not steal it. But if you're just a passenger, you get on the bus, you have a chat with someone, you get off the bus, there's another person, you get on another bus, you say, hello, how are you doing? And you spend all your time hopping from bus to bus. Now, I'll show you something very wonderful for this. This is called a freedom pass. <laughs> I am now 60 years of age, and so I am an officially recognized bus hopper. <laughs> so it's nothing to do with Buddhism or practice. It's something to do with taxes and Ken Livingston. <laughs> but that's essentially how we need to be. It means we are traveling people. The basic word for human being is, in, in Tibetan, is drowa. Drowa means going, as a verb, it means to go. So a drowa is a person who is going or moving. That's very helpful. That is our actual situation. We're traveling through time, we're moving, we're touched by circumstances. But we often have a fantasy that we're not. We may feel we're the driver of the bus. We may feel we're the observer of the situation. We may feel that we're the director of the bus service, sitting in the central command office. But actually, we're just passengers. We're participants. And that's where equanimity comes in. That Sometimes on the bus you sit next to someone, it's easy to chat with, sometimes they're not easy to chat with. But being in connection with the other is to be in connection with yourself. Because as soon as you turn your face away from the other, you're diminishing yourself. What you're saying is, I can't, I don't like, which means I am small. This is very challenging. This is very challenging. It doesn't mean that you should put yourself in danger. It doesn't mean you should go into bad clubs or walk home late at night and through bad streets. It doesn't mean anything like that. What it means, though, is always, how do I limit myself? That's the most central basic inquiry. What are the judgments I have about who I am? And how does that limit myself? Now, clearly... Our socio-political backgrounds give a certain determination. Some people may have been involved in political struggles for equal opportunities, for gay rights, for anti-prejudicial uh, structures and so on. These are very important. It's important to live these things. But to inhabit a political stance too strongly is just another prison. 
because it means you're living a life of opposition. At a certain point, if we want to follow this kind of path, we have to think, <coughs> who is the oppressor? What is it that causes other people to be oppressive towards us? And if we can recognize their Buddha nature, their open potential, and this is how it has become tied in a knot, and the consequence of that knot is that they are hostile towards me, then we have three possibilities of attention. We can attend to how they are hostile towards me, which we might need to resist, deal with. We've got how they are tied in knots. That offers us a few more moves. And then we've got their basic potential, which is open. That offers a whole kind of different kind of welcome. And I would suggest it's very useful to hold all three at once. If you only go into their open potential, then you're going to get exploited. Being, uh, being awakened is not being naive. If you're only into their knots, you don't attend to the harm they do. You know, many people in prison have been terrible victims in their life, but they've also kicked the shit out of someone, so they're a bit dangerous. So, seeing all three simultaneously, the openness, the way that potential has been closed down by the knotting, and the actual difficulty of the manifesting forms allows us to stay safe without putting the other in a box. We're saying the moment of the enacted difficult behavior, dangerous behavior, that's serious. I'm here. I'm not going to get hit. But I'm not going to define them as always dangerous because I can see the root cause of that in terms of the knotting, and I can see the root of the root which is the unrecognized open Buddha nature. So, in that way, we can start to deconstruct the intensity of the notion of an enemy. And then we also need to apply the same analysis to friends. This person is my friend. They are my, seem to be manifesting as my friend due to these causal situations. And the root of that is a state that is open and undefined. So if I'm appropriating them, if I'm holding on to them as just my friend, I'm forgetting the dynamic basis for that, and I'm also ignoring the basic openness of their being. So we are experiencing friendly contact. Friendly contact is dynamic. It's now. It's now. And then it may not happen again. Life is meetings and partings. At the moment, we're meeting together in this room. Whether we meet again, we don't know. You may never want to meet again. You may want to meet again, but factors run across it and make it impossible. I can die, you can die, all sorts of things can happen. We don't know. The certain thing is that we're here. Then we need to review again and again, what is it that stops me being here? So, just in a very brief summary, the key thing is trusting from the very beginning our own nature is completely pure. This means that all the activities you've done, all the thoughts, feelings, sensations, have been moving across and through the open space of your life without marking it or damaging it or improving it. Awareness itself is not a thing you can never find it, you can never lose it. You can't catch it, it's already there as the basis of your experience moment by moment. It reveals everything in the universe. All of this is the natural radiance of the mind, the effortless spontaneous display. And within this field of disclosure, we arise moment by moment, just like rainbows in the sky, like the moon on water, gesture, gesture, only energy, and then we'll die. Dying is simply the gestural movement of the energy, goes back into the field of reflection, the field of reflection goes into the space of openness, then into that space of openness comes another field of reflection, and inside that, there's a specific movement, and so life goes on. 
when we don't recognize this, we overemphasize our limited, separated existence. <clears throat> in order to maintain ourselves, we rely on our thoughts. Our thoughts are developed in a culture. A culture is full of prejudices and assumptions. And so we become inhabited with strong views, limited perceptions, and a fragile sense of self. None of us can have a secure ego. By definition, the ego isn't secure. Some people can be very pompous and inflated and dominating and so on. But that doesn't mean that they're basically secure inside. So the movement towards awakening is to very gently, very kindly start to explore how am I, how do I diminish myself, restrict myself, tie myself in knots, and through that, we start to untie these knots. We start to trust ourselves more. And by relaxing into the state of openness and emptiness, that is the true natural equanimity. So that then, in that state of openness, we come into this world, recognizing that this world is us. Because I <coughs> am in this room with you. Each of you is in the room with everyone else. This is our room. When you go out of this room, you go into our street. You go from our street to our second street, to our second street. Then you go to your home, which is our home, even if you live on your own. Everything in that house is linked out to the world. So we are always connected. That is to say, the individual self is a movement in the reflection in the mirror. You cannot pop out of that mirror. There is no separated individual self. We are always with others. And therefore, wisdom and compassion is as natural as breathing in and out. When we realize that, we don't have to strive or struggle. It just flows very easily. <coughs> so in that way, we've covered love, compassion, joy, and equanimity. They all have the same flavor. Love in welcoming and being for the happiness of all beings means may all beings rest in their own natural condition and experience this effortless integration. Compassion means may the obstacles that arise in them to the recognition of their own nature dissolve like the morning mist. <coughs> Joy means in that state of openness, may they see that good and bad ha are equal qualities and that they flow without any substance in themselves. And equanimity is to stay relaxed and open with whatever happens. If good times come, you're present. If bad times come, you're present. Because being present, being fully alive, the vitality of unborn subjectivity is much more important than the temporary uh, relief that comes from finding a good object or avoiding a bad object. Because when you overinvest in the object, you will forget who you are. The answer doesn't lie in the object. The object is your own luminous energy. Okay, so now we move towards the end. We do some final meditation practice. <coughs> we do this practice we did yesterday, reciting R three times. So, we sit, spine erect, head slightly raised, our gaze in the space in front of us. In this uh, space we can see a uh, letter R, the capital A, or the Tibetan A if you know it, surrounded by a ball of rainbow light. This represents the enlightened state of all the teachers, which is not separate from our own state. In the center of our hearts, there is an infinite openness. So we recite the ah, the sound of ah three times. This openness in our heart expands 
including our body, the whole room, and integrates in the state of the teachers in front of us. Then gradually they dissolve and we just rest completely open with whatever comes. Cars going by, people moving, the wind on our face and so on. Without moving, let the mind move. Awareness and the mind are not the same. Keep awareness relaxed and let the thoughts, feelings and sensations go as they please. from our study and practice together for the sake of all beings. So we can imagine rays of light spreading out from our hearts and touching all beings in the universe. Go on the Nyadunda Ujjan Lama Drajuni Drawa Chichama Rupa Desala Kepa so, now we come to the end of our brief time together. Pass is quickly like everything else. Um, I'd like to thank our host and organizer, Gordon, and uh, Charles for doing the recording, and that can be available to you if you would like that later, and to all the people who helped to uh, get the room set up, set out the teas and so on. It's uh, very nice to be here because things flow so easily. There's more and more a sense of easy participation, which is really the embodiment of the practice. I'd like to thank you all for coming and you know, participating, because that's also something very precious, to have the sense that it's worth finding out more of how the Dharma operates, but also how we operate. Some of the things that are discussed are not very easy. And it's a, this uh, quality of curiosity and enthusiasm inside ourselves, which when we develop it, allows us to make the longer and more difficult journeys when, when we're traversing these empty plains by ourselves. So, being good camels and having a good drink here, I wish you long miles of happiness. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we meet again, but we never know. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. My pleasure. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. The end. <laughs> Ooh la la, Shambo.